Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen Boss scams the company, gets what she deserves. I, 30s female, have been a people pleaser to a fault my whole life. I've been working in marketing for over 10 years now. Over these years, I've had my fair share of bosses who were good, average, and some who really sucked. This one in particular stood out as awful. This story's from about five years ago. Pamela, in her 40s, not her real name, was the VP of marketing and sales for a mid-sized retailer. She started at the company a few years after I did, and if rumors were true, she was the fourth pick for the position and was simply hired so the company could appease the shareholders. I was a manager under her, and my whole job was to make sure the website and stores had their products merchandised properly, received all their monthly sales materials, managed advertising, set up and managed the department's budget, PM'd all department projects and operations, created reports to reflect sales, managed presentations, creative briefs for future projects, etc. In short, I did her work and all of the administrative grunt work to keep the department afloat. I managed all this because I had access to her email and many times sent emails on her behalf to keep the department functioning. Pamela spent most of her time showing up after 10 a.m., taking business lunches and planning company parties. I don't even know why we did those, but I planned those too. I consistently questioned why she spent so much of our budget on these events when we didn't have the budget resources for any of it. Pamela told me to take from future months' budgets to pay for the current months' overspending. So at the start of every month, I had an original budget, and by the end of the month, I had to turn in an edited budget, edited under Pamela's direction, that made it look like Pamela's spending was under control. This is important for later. I definitely made mistakes here and there, being in charge of so many tasks and constantly found myself working 12-hour days split between being in the office and working after my kid went to bed. Weekend work was also done before my family woke up and after they went to bed. During Pamela's first major holiday season, sales were crap. Pamela kept changing her mind on the visuals for the stores, kept bringing on new advertising and PR agencies to bring in sales. All these agencies consisted of her personal friends and ignored our buying and merchandise team's planned promotions for her own better ones. At this time, I had been dealing with an ongoing infection that turned to sepsis and was hospitalized. The doctors and my husband said it was due to the stress from work and that I needed to take a break. As I recovered, I realized how much I was hurting myself, my family, and even the company I worked for. Eventually, my old habits got to me and I got on my phone and checked mine and my boss's emails. What I found made my blood boil. First, I got a lovely bouquet of flowers from upper management wishing me well and I knew that Pamela organized the delivery. She sent me her favorite flowers. I went to her inbox to put the receipt in the correct folder to send to accounting when I got back. At the top of her inbox from the past three days were emails clearly not related to business. What I found in her emails was Pamela emailing her personal friends griping on how I can't just shake off sepsis and get back to work. She also complained that she couldn't find any of my notes, spreadsheets, or documents for any of the work she was technically in charge of. They were on our shared drive labeled very clearly. Finally, I found an email where she sent a friend from a previous company asking for advice on how to bring in sales and save her job. In the long thread, this old colleague asked if there was anyone managing most of the work, and of course, Pamela said I was. This colleague explained that clearly it was my mismanagement that was causing issues and that I could be blamed if sales didn't pull through by the end of the season. Pamela mentioned that I was in the hospital and repeated comments from her other email thread. This person said that she couldn't outright fire me because it could seem like retaliation because I needed to take emergency medical leave. But if Pamela could prove I was stealing from the company or misusing company resources, then she would have grounds to fire me and use me as a scapegoat. Upon my return, Pamela called me into her office and said she was worried I was taking on too much and wanted to take work off my plate. She announced she was taking managing the department budget off my plate. She asked me to only drop a small stack of invoices to accounting. Additionally, Pamela told me under no circumstances was I allowed to talk to accounting about anything regarding budgets. Also, if I had any concerns about the department or workload, I wasn't allowed to go to HR. I had to discuss it directly with Pamela. Oh yeah, I could see where this was going. Unfortunately for Pamela, I had built good rapport with Lois, who was in her 50s, not her real name, who was our main accountant. Lois always said that she would do anything in her power to help me should I ask. Knowing this, I grabbed the stack of invoices off Pamela's desk to give to accounting. 
I also added the email threads I read while I was in the hospital and the current, unedited budget that Pamela hadn't touched yet for months. I also found in my filing cabinet the hard copies of old budgets with Pamela's handwriting on what numbers to change to balance our budget. Finally, I added an email from our first round of budget adjustments where Pamela had threatened to put someone else in my job if I couldn't do what she asked. So I walked and dropped off the invoices to accounting when I bumped into Lois. She brought up invoices and I sternly looked at her and said Pamela is the only one in our department that Lois is allowed to talk to about our budget and invoices. Lois saw the suspiciously thick file folder on her desk, gave a firm nod, and lovingly kicked me out of her office. Within the week, Pamela was fired. From what I understand, she's been continually job hopping for the past few years. The CEO and HR brought me in to personally apologize for everything I went through and gave me a paid one-week vacation to take at my discretion. Given other issues with the business, I left after another year. Which brings me to today. I am, once again, a manager for sales and marketing. I have a wonderful boss, Mike, who's in his 40s, who trusts my business decisions and backs me up on practically everything. We're hiring my team for me to solely manage and direct. Today, I looked through the applicants and found Pamela's resume sitting among dozens of others. I stared at her name, wondering how many other people share her name. Upon review, yup, it's her. She definitely fell down the corporate ladder, with VP of our old company being the highest title she earned. And to no surprise, she embellished her achievements, claiming the work I managed as her own and claimed she generated 87% sales growth during the holiday season at our previous company. As a people pleaser who firmly believes in giving everyone a chance, it has never been so satisfying to click disqualified. Edit. To those suggesting I interview her to see her reaction, I would have loved to see her face as she walked in. But I felt it would have risked my boss's trust in my decision-making ability. Maybe I'll send a personally written rejection email. You are clearly too nice. I would have definitely called HR to arrange an interview, assuming you would be sitting across from her. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing the face of someone like that when they see karma staring them in their face. I'm losing my marriage to my wife's hobby. Is there a fair compromise that won't make us resent each other? As of last night, it looks like my marriage is headed towards a divorce, largely in part due to my wife's hobby of running. As a background, we've been married for 11 years and we have two kids who are under the age of 10. When we met years ago, my main hobbies were yoga and casually participating in triathlons. My wife enjoyed fitness activities at the time, but didn't do anything in particular. Over time, she started to get involved in both yoga and triathlons so that we could spend time together doing it. This morphed here and there as we got married and had kids and time marched on, but we were always doing something. When my wife became pregnant with our second, she decided that she liked yoga so much that she would like to pursue being an instructor. This was time intensive and costly, but we did it. After our second was born, she left her office job to be a stay-at-home mom and to start teaching yoga on the side. She loved this so much, she decided she wanted to do fitness full-time when the kids were both in school. So in preparation, she picked up multiple other certifications to teach many different things, including personal training. As our kids got older, she started teaching more and more, but quickly realized that this was taking a toll on her body and burning her out. It just wasn't possible to do this full-time for her. It was about this time, four years ago, that she thought maybe it was just the wrong fitness path and maybe she should pursue running coaching. I supported this as we were both running together at that time and doing small races. At this point, she's teaching multiple types of fitness classes and working on her running certification. She also starts putting significant effort into her personal running. She started preparing for her first marathon when lockdown hit. Instead of backing off the training since there were no races, she decided to stay in marathon shape just in case. For two years, she spent significant time every week on running, which I fully supported, although I thought that level of training with no down season was not a great idea. During this time, she started running with different groups and got to know many of the local runners. Eventually, lockdown ends and she can do her first marathon. She's hooked. Our kids are now in school full-time as well. Through her relationships, she gets offered a part-time job doing small running programs for a local store. This new job paid just over $3,000 in 2022, and that was before tax was taken out. In exchange for this, she gives up two to three weeknights and one weekend morning. In addition, she has not stopped being in full marathon training mode since she started. Between personal running and her running groups, she spends a little over 20 hours a week on running. 
Around eight months ago, she decides she's fully burnt out on her other endeavors and quits teaching classes entirely. That's the background, and now onto the issue. In order to fit this all in and to run with her personal running buddies, even though she's home during the day when the kids are in school, she has moved her schedule. Most days of the week, she gets up at 4 a.m. to do her runs. This is when her friends meet. In her mind, this is her getting her running in when it doesn't impact me or the family. The problem is that all she has done is shift waking hours. My day with her is essentially waking up and getting the kids ready for school while I get ready for work. She'll get home in the middle of this and I will leave for work. I get home and either we eat dinner, have a kid's sport event, or she leaves for a training group. On a good day, I'll have two hours with her until she's asleep just after the kids around 8. On a bad day, she walks in the door around 8 and falls asleep. I then sit alone in the living room for a few hours before I head to bed. The next day, the whole thing starts over again. Around three months ago, things got even more complicated. She decided that $3,000 a year was not enough for her to contribute financially and fitness just wasn't going to be a full-time career. She decided to get a full-time office job. This was difficult and emotional decision for her as she felt she was giving up on what she was passionate about. Now the day looks the same except she's working during the day and then running out the door to go to her running groups which is now called a hobby. She's fully unable to step away from this. Unless it's a fully scheduled off day, she will not miss running. If we're on a family vacation, she's going to find a way to get a run in every day. I've become so unbearably lonely. I work a high stress job that pays well but is always weighing on me in some way. I feel that I'm a pretty good husband. I'm involved with the kids, I help with their school projects, and I take them to their sporting events. I practice with them in the yard all the time. I do at least my fair share of the housework, including dishes and laundry and other cleaning. I take care of myself physically by working out on my lunch hour so I don't have to take more time for my family. I just have no relationship with my wife since she's always gone or sleeping. This has been an ongoing discussion for months now. I've expressed to her how lonely I am. I've told her that I don't need much, but I do need some affection from her. I would love to just sit on the couch and cuddle and watch a movie sometime. I've expressed my needs directly and multiple times, but nothing has changed. This all came to a head since last weekend. It started with a rare date night. She ran a race Saturday morning, so I spent the morning with the kids getting the house cleaned, yard mowed, and everything taken care of. I had coordinated to have a sitter watch the kids and made dinner reservations. The night went well, but when we got home at around 8.30, she fell asleep right away without saying a word to me. Later, while talking about a family vacation this year, she let me know that she's been planning two destination marathons in early spring. I had heard her mention that she was wishing she could do one of them, but due to timing, I cannot go with her since the kids are in school. I thought this meant it was still a discussion. One of these will cost thousands of dollars to attend. She has made up her mind that she's going to both of them since one is for a Boston qualifier and the other was offered for free. She didn't want to tell me about these since she thought it would upset me, although she claimed she dropped hints. Since she has a new job, this will take nearly all of her time off and we will not be able to have a family vacation. She's not willing to miss either of these. To top it off, she then told me that she will be gone on our anniversary in two weeks because she was invited to be a pacer for a race coming up and was offered a free hotel to do it. She's never done this before and is excited to try it. She claims she hasn't committed to this already and is still deciding, but I'm pretty sure she already said yes and just hasn't told me yet. I was very hurt by this since I already feel like I'm a much lower priority than running to her. This all broke me. I dumped and told her how this made me feel. There were tears on both sides. She claims that she feels like I'm always mad at her and I'm not supportive of her and she has to keep her running life from me. This is what leads to the lack of affection. I explained my feelings and reiterated how lonely I am. I asked her if she would be willing to find a compromise and maybe focus on shorter races and she told me no that if I made her do that, she would resent me and this is what makes her happy. I asked if she would try couples therapy and while open, there isn't a time that would work based on her new job. There was one small win where I asked if I hypothetically asked her to take one week off from running, would she be able to do it? She said no. She would be mad if I asked and unable to actually do it anyway. Upon saying this, she said that it makes it sound like she's addicted to running. I don't believe that's wrong. She has said that she will consider individual therapy, but we'll see if she does that. For my part, I came into work and scheduled a psychologist appointment for tomorrow. It's virtual, but I'll see if it helps me work through this on my end. I do want to say I'm proud of her and she's doing amazing. She's now at a level where she wins races, or at the very least her age group, but it has come at such a huge cost. I love her, 
but don't know how much longer I can reasonably keep this up. I'm sure I come across as an unsupportive monster, and this is all one-sided. I've seen how the running community rallies around itself, and I'm somewhat worried I'll get torn apart on that level as well. I'm just so lonely. I miss my wife. I don't think she's willing to compromise. The way you explain it, she's absolutely obsessed with this, and she's willing to lose her family over it. When you ask her to compromise, she threatens resentment. This is no longer a hobby, this is a straight unhealthy obsession. There's nothing wrong with having something that doesn't include your spouse or your kids, but to this degree of time sucks. I don't understand how she doesn't see it as neglectful towards her family relationships. OP. I think it's an obsession as well. She doesn't see it that way though. To her, it's pursuing something she's good at and has made a lot of friends doing. She claims that she would be going to bed early even if she wasn't running, but that's not how things used to be. There's plenty of people that have running obsessions, but still manage to be engaged partners. She should arrange her running around her life, not her life around her running. That means compromises, like getting her run in when it's most convenient for the family. Maybe her lunch break, not necessarily when the running group meets. I'm an ultra runner, so I run races in the 30 to 100 mile range, and I spend way more time with my partner than your wife seems to with you. Also, every runner should be fine with taking a week off running. A week is not going to meaningfully affect your fitness, and the fact that she can't take a week off shows that she's currently deeply in the unhealthy running mindset. Most people in that frame of mind are so hyper-focused that they're unable to be reasonable, and they either burn out or get injured. Ultimately, you can't force her to see reason in this, so you need to think about what you want and how much you're willing to put up with. Deciding to use almost all of her vacation time on races instead of with the family shows you that she's operating from a very selfish, single-person mindset right now. She's making decisions for herself without considering you or your family. She said running less would make her unhappy, but she's fine with you being unhappy like you are now. Time to think about what's going to make you happy, since no one else is. Unpopular opinion, but leave her OP. This is no different than when a husband is obsessed with video games instead of his family. Once you have a family of your own, it's time to make them the top priority, not running, skiing, biking, or any other hobby people have. She's made it clear that her little jogs will always be more important than your family is to her, so it's time to do what you know you need to do. I'd be petty and tell her, since running is so important to you, I've decided to find a few hobbies of my own that I've been doing, and one of them looks like a supermodel. My mom's friend asked for 10% of my income. So my mom's friend is saying that God will bless me if I gave her 10% of my income when my mom and late grandma had been financially supporting her for almost as long as I've been alive. I'm 30. A few weeks after that, I texted her that I wouldn't be giving her the money. She called me back, I let it go to voicemail, and gave me some Bible verse to look up that was about helping the needy. After she sent that, I texted her that it seemed as though she was trying to take advantage of me and then I blocked her. Apparently, she's been calling me. My mom told me that she wanted me to return her call, but obviously I hadn't been answering since she had been blocked. Anyway, she called my mom today and told my mom that while I was in high school or college, I told her that I'd give her some of my income when I was done with school. I have no recollection of that. So today, I briefly unblocked her and I sent this text message. Hi. My mom told me that you contacted her, so I'll say these last few thoughts and then I'm done with this entire conversation. I'm not sure what I told you while I was in high school or college, but if I said that I'd give you 10% of my income, then, which I have no recollection of, I apologize. Inflation is rising, student loan repayments are restarting, and I live in a high cost of living area. I cannot afford to support you, your family, and myself. I would really appreciate it if you don't contact me or my mom about this again, because as I've mentioned, it seems like you're trying to use me, especially the fact that you're now contacting my mom about me giving you money. Two generations of my family have supported you and yours, do you ask anyone else's family for money as much as you do mine? You preyed on my mom and grandma's generosity, and now you're trying to prey on me. I'm frankly sick of it. If you're in financial need, I suggest getting a real job. Read 2 Thessalonians 3.10, as praying isn't a real job. Or as I've mentioned before, you could reach out to a church charity, or even apply for government assistance. There are programs that can help you out, but you'd rather try to take advantage of me. It's not my job to subsidize your lifestyle. I've now blocked you, by the way, so if you call, I won't even know you did. After sending that message, I blocked her again. I'm so sick of her always begging, but the silver lining in all of this is that I think my mom is finally starting to see what elite she is. 
And for the record, my mom is not encouraging me to give her money. My mom supports my decision not to. Edit. So it's clear, my mom and grandma never gave her a percentage of their income. When I say that they financially supported her, I mean that she'd frequently say that she needed money for something like rent and they'd help her out. I have a well-paying job and I make more than my mom and more than my grandma did. So I think that's why she specifically asked me for 10% of my income. Would I be the jerk for divorcing my husband to get more me time? My husband, who's 40, and I, 39 female, have been married for 12 years, together for 13. We're in a wonderful marriage overall. However, I typically end up with the brunt of housework, cooking, errands, laundry, and early morning wake-ups with the youngest of our two boys, who are 6 and 13, even on Saturdays and Sundays. I also spend a lot of time cleaning up behind my husband because he forgets to do things. Because of this, I usually end up with almost no free time and I never get to be the one who sleeps in. A lot of the things he forgets are small, like leaving shoes out in the walkway or leaving the lint from the lint trap on top of the dryer instead of throwing it away, or continuing to put trash in an already full trash can, used glasses left out instead of brought to the sink, used wash rags left on the shower floor, etc. It sounds petty, but over time, all these little things are a lot of time out of my life cleaning up after a grown man when I'm already cleaning up after two non-grown-ups. I own a business and I'm working on my degree on top of all of this, so I have very little spare time as it is. He, on the other hand, works from home and is able to sleep in, take nap breaks, play video games on his lunch break, and takes an hour or two every morning while I study to play video games again to decompress. He does give me time to go to the gym or run, but I've been skipping it more and more to try to keep up with the mess and chores at home. When I bring it up, he says I'm being unfair because I'm focusing on the few times he forgets to pick up after himself and not seeing all the things that he does do. He does clean up after himself about 50% of the time, depending on what it is. But some things he legitimately never does, like leaving lint on the dryer or throwing away used toilet paper rolls. He also suffers from a sleep disorder, which can make a person feel foggy sometimes. He says I should be more compassionate with him and accept this as part of loving someone with chronic illness. The truth is that I do understand what chronic illness is like, and I do have compassion. I myself have been living with chronic pain and fatigue for years, and I'm finally undergoing the diagnostic and treatment process for lupus and RA. I'm always in pain and constantly exhausted, but I muscle through and maintain a reasonable level of order and sanitation in my home because that's what adults do for their kids. I don't have the luxury to forget to do important things like laundry, dishes, or cleaning because then no one does it. He also says I have an unreasonably high standard of cleanliness. Really, I feel like not wanting to leave urine stains around the base of the toilet or leaving used dishes and food on counters in an area notorious for roaches is not having a high standard. I feel like his standards are lower than the average adult, as most people would find that pretty gross. One of the things my journey through AID has taught me is to learn to say no. Although I love my husband and best friend dearly, I don't see this ever changing unless he is literally forced. I'm starting to feel like taking myself out of the equation is the best option to maintain my own sanity by having one less person to clean up after and find some much needed downtime through shared custody. Even if he only had the kids on one day a week, I feel like custody sharing might force him to hold himself to a reasonable standard of hygiene and cleanliness too. I definitely enable his laziness out of necessity to meet basic safe levels of cleanliness. Without me there, he'd have to learn to be consistent or risk losing visitation. This is my only complaint within the marriage. We really do love and care for each other and he's emotionally very kind and supportive. I love him very much. Would I be the jerk for divorcing over this? Update. Yes, we have talked about it a lot. We have the same fight at least once every other week for over a decade. We've tried counseling, nothing changed. Even after our therapist told him that even though he was loving and supportive, resentment was a marriage ender. He suggested a maid service. He doesn't want to spend money on a cleaning service. I would love to have weekly cleanings. I was able to talk him into one cleaning per month. I'm working on increasing my earning potential so I can afford it myself. Yes, he does have diagnosed ADHD. I feel like this is a potential explanation, not an excuse thing though. I know divorce is expensive, but I have a very supportive family and I'm very close to expanding my business and attaining degrees that would allow me to be autonomous. That being said, we care a lot about each other, parent well together, and have a lot that we've built together. Update. We fought about it. I ended up ugly crying, partially out of frustration and partially because I had been up since 4.45 with our youngest. I told him that it was about lint on the washer and used toilet rolls on the sink. 
but not really. I said that I felt like he didn't listen nor care to try. We apologized, wrapped me up in our duvet, and left me to nap while he took over housework and kids. He really is sweet and he does try. It's been nice to have a day off, but I'm still skeptical because this isn't the first time I've gotten to a point of walking away or being really upset, and he's extra nice for a while, only to go right back to being his old self in a few days. I guess we'll see. Update. So after the meltdown from the day of the last post, he did as promised and took over housework and the kids for the day. However, as I feared, by the next day, he had returned to his old, dismissive, chauvinistic self. He did zero housework for the rest of the week and picking up the slack ended up putting me in a position of unpreparedness for a very important test due tomorrow. This is his usual MO. He puts in effort just long enough to make me think he has changed, then he reverts. Starting Sunday, I reminded him frequently that I needed time to study. It's a math test and it's hard. So my plan was to study two hours per day and be prepared by Friday. This meant he would need to pick up at least a little slack giving baths, reading bedtime stories, etc. so I could focus. Except it didn't happen. So I ended up using the time I needed to study to cook, clean, and do laundry. Now it's late on the eve of the test and I've had all of one hour of study time. I'm exhausted and I can't even fathom practicing proportions or quadratic equations right now. I broke down out of frustration and told him I can't handle it anymore. I run my business, bust my butt in school, and keep everything running. It's a major unfair burden and I'm trying to make him care. I asked him how it was that he could treat his female coworkers as equals and not extend that same respect to me. He admitted to being a hypocrite and stormed off to play video games. Right now I'm contemplating taking incompletes for the semester so I can focus on my business and weather a messy divorce from a giant man baby. When I left, I had gone on hiatus. This guy's clothes were piled literally six feet high out of the laundry bin and he was buying socks and underwear and undershirts new because I wasn't washing them. There was also no clean dishes because I had only cleaned the dishes I dirtied. Y'all, we had a dishwasher. The clean dishes were in the dishwasher. I came back a few months later and it was like a bomb had dropped, straight trash. I hope OP leaves that lazy man-child. For real. When I left, I kept paying the housekeeper and the garden service because the house needed to be sold. The garden service actually called me to find out what happened to the house because it was so gross. The housekeeper refused to work for my ex. The best part of leaving a man-child like this is that even with kids, your workload lightens exponentially. I hope she gets her divorce. I'm willing to bet her life will be so much better then. When I finally had the jerk ex leave my home, I had people asking how I'd manage. We had no kids, but he left me the cat and the dog, a big house and all of his mess, since he bothered to take only his clothes, his video games, and his collector items. The truth is that, after a week of a lot of cleaning, my burden was instantly lighter. I was already caring for the pets, I was already cooking and cleaning, and it was never enough because he behaved like a teenager, leaving crumbs and messes everywhere. Only now, I had just my own messes to clean. I didn't have anyone insulting me because I wasn't fast enough with laundry, with dishes, or anything. I didn't have anyone getting angry at me because we were both broke, and I didn't want to spend the last money I had on a big collector edition of something for him. Now I live alone, in a smaller house with my pets. I'm still struggling with the BS mechanisms and the mental issues he left me with, but my life is so much easier. Is my wife flirting with her coworker? My wife and I have been together for 10 years, married for nearly five, and we have a three-year-old son. We're fairly happy, though we have been having couples counseling for six months, as we found being parents very difficult. We've been making a lot of progress with our communication lately, but today that all fell apart. My wife has autistic traits, which run in both our families, and I have ADHD, so we are a neurodivergent couple. That's probably relevant here. My wife recently moved back into our shared office as we both work from home. Today, she hopped on a video call with a guy from work who she's friends with, and I stepped out to take a quick call about something else. After my call was finished, I just sat scrolling Reddit for a bit, but could hear their conversation, and it increasingly made me uncomfortable. My wife sounded like a completely different person. She would tut and giggle before she said anything. She was constantly joking with him every sentence. She was energetic, and it all sounded so incredibly flirty. He had called her, not for anything work-related, but to tell her he had taken a new job in the city closest to us. He currently lives far away. She said things like, Do me a favor. When that job contract comes, just rip it up so you don't have to leave. And, As long as you are always available for me on Microsoft Teams. 
and then went on to confirm that they had each other on WhatsApp, etc. All the while joking about various things and giggling in a way that I never hear her do, ever. They were talking for 20 minutes and I almost started to record them so she could hear herself back, but they said goodbye just after I started. It just made me feel so gross listening to it. This isn't the first time I've noticed their flirtiness and I brought it up last year after she started that new job. They were calling each other outside of work hours and she added him on the PlayStation and they would sit and game together in the evenings chatting away with the same giggly flirty tone. She was talking about him a lot and telling me lots of really personal things about his childhood and parents and stuff. It caused issues when I brought up that it made me feel uncomfortable, especially one night when we were supposed to have time together but she just forgot and spent the night playing games with him. She denies flirting at all and she says that he's just a work friend. Around that time, she traveled to the central office and I know he had invited her for dinner at his place, which hadn't happened in the end, I think, because I said I wasn't comfortable with it. They did end up still going out for dinner in the city together though, as friends. The thing is, I'm not a jealous person. Over the years, my wife has had a few crushes, one of them being my uni roommate who's like a younger brother to me. It's kind of a running joke that they both fancy each other a bit and I genuinely don't mind and I think it's funny. We joke about one day hooking up with him, etc. I do know that she is prone to the occasional crush and I don't take it seriously, but have once or twice over the decade felt like I had to point out some boundaries. So back to today. After they finished their call, I said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? When I then said that she probably wouldn't like what I was about to say, she immediately got defensive and walked off and said she wasn't going to have this conversation. Since I hadn't even said anything yet, that intuitively tells me that some part of her knows the way she was talking to him was probably a bit inappropriate. I got upset and said I was feeling uncomfortable with the way she was talking with him again, that it sounds like heavy flirting to me, that I would feel uncomfortable if I talked to another woman at work like that, or if a girl talked to me like that, even as a clueless guy, I would be getting a strong vibe that she fancies me, that I feel hurt by it, and that if she talked to me like that, it would be a dream come true. She basically dismissed it all very defensively and said she wasn't flirting at all, that I just didn't want her to be friends with him, that she doesn't understand what she's done wrong and that she's fed up with me being like this, even though I haven't spoken to her about this since last summer and never been jealous in our 10-year relationship. I feel like I'm being gaslit as it seems like such obvious flirting and she's just dismissing it all as in my head. It caused a massive argument. I'm willing to admit that me getting upset about it is likely some insecurity. But at the same time, I feel like I know what I saw and heard and that I'm an understanding person. I'm okay with crushing, but this just crosses a line. I should be able to say that, no? I think it's more likely to do with my wife's autistic traits and not understanding that social norms are boundaries. I don't know. She doesn't realize how flirty she's being sometimes. I think that's definitely true. I wish she would flirt with me by accident a bit more. Is it okay for me to feel upset by this or am I being controlling and irrational? Update. I ended up showing my wife the post I had written and it was so validating to feel like I wasn't going insane. We had a really difficult conversation about it all and we were both so angry at each other until she told me the truth. In a rather heated moment, she kind of venomously said something like, I like talking to him because when I do I feel happy and relaxed, like I can be myself, which is something I can never feel when I'm around you. This really made me sad and I instantly wasn't angry anymore. I just apologized and told her that that's just how I wanted her to feel around me again. That feeling of being herself is something she has lost after becoming a mom and the difficult few years we've had since lockdown. We don't have and never have had any help being parents from our extended families and so we never have time together for ourselves. She didn't have any feelings for him beyond friend and I do think she was genuinely being naive and a little willingly ignorant about him pushing boundaries. A few examples which came out after we talked about it. He had asked to come back to her hotel room to continue chatting after the work party for example. But when we looked at the big picture, she could see and did admit that she had unwittingly begun down the path of some kind of emotional affair which she didn't really know was a thing. She took responsibility for this and did stop talking to the guy and told him that she would only be talking to him if it was work related from then on. She left that job shortly after so that was also easier for us. Funny enough, it did come out after he left that he had made some advances and been awkward with a few other of my wife's colleagues. People noticed at work that my wife had stopped being friendly with him and was asked, was it because he was being weird with you as well? We talked a lot in counseling about it. I think a massive problem that I had to acknowledge was that she had gotten to a place where she expected me to be angry and irritated by things 
because that's definitely something I've struggled with. So she had begun hiding stuff in fear of how I would respond. She didn't feel like she could talk to me about stuff. When she did admit to her wrongdoing and acknowledge she had begun to push me away and prioritize things above our relationship, she was surprised at how kind and patient and forgiving I was. I was surprised too. We kind of figured out that a lot of the anger and irritation was often because I could tell that I wasn't getting the whole truth. That's all I wanted, her to be straight with me so I know where I stand. That and my feelings to be acknowledged, both of which are a massive trigger for me. We also began working on having date nights every Friday and having difficult conversations with 100% honesty while set together, looking at each other and holding hands so that we were connecting and feeling listened to. The problem here is that you've allowed this to go on for your entire relationship. You should have set clear boundaries from the beginning, but instead you played along with her gross actions and disrespect. How are men like you raised to be okay with this kind of disrespect? Did you see your parents doing this kind of thing while you were growing up? Either you set your boundaries and demand the respect that you need, or you will be in a situation like this with someone who sees you as a walking ATM and thinks it's okay to flirt with other men, which yes, that's exactly what she was doing and you know it, OP. Don't let these Reddit people convince you otherwise. Karen betrays me and goes after my ex-boyfriend, even though she knows how in love with him I still am. I'm 32, female, and my ex-boyfriend is male, 35. We broke up about five months ago after four years together. He's the most amazing guy and I love him so much. These past few months have been the worst of my life. He's very handsome and successful and rich, which is relevant. I'm sure he will not have any problems getting into a new relationship. He broke up with me because we don't want the same things in life. He wants to have kids and have a family, but I don't. I think we stayed together for so long, even though we knew we wanted different things. We probably kind of thought we would change or change each other and that love is all that mattered. I still love him, but I don't know if he still loves me. When we broke up, I asked for a clean break. That means no contact because I needed to get over him. My friends know all of this and they know how much I still love him. One of my best friends, who's 28, jokingly said that he was now up for grabs a month after we broke up. I ignored her. I thought it was a bad joke. She's very beautiful and she basically can get whoever she wants. She's always said that she's never been rejected before and I believe her. I know my ex didn't really like her because she wants a rich guy and because she's had a lot of plastic surgery done. Last time we had dinner, she brought up wanting to date him, and one of my other friends said that we didn't do that to each other. She laughed it off and said, Well, you can try, but you are not his type. She said that she's never been rejected before, and this is where I might have been the jerk. I told her he didn't like greedy girls with lip injections and plastic surgery. She started crying, telling me now she won't feel bad whenever she takes him because I'm a jerk. My friends sided with her on that one. I waited until I was in my car to start crying. I don't think I'm the jerk. She knows I still love him and I'm not over him. Couldn't she at least wait? I know she's panicking because she kept saying that he won't be single for long. I don't know. Tell me if I should apologize. Update. I talked to a mutual friend today. My former best friend has asked my ex for dinner about two weeks ago, the same week we had our fight. She took him to one of my favorite restaurants that she knows we both loved. Anyway, after the dinner, he stopped answering her calls and texts. I don't know what happened there and why he agreed to having dinner with her and I can't help but cry and feel hurt. I know this is juvenile and I need to let it go, but I couldn't stop crying anyway. But I need to work on myself and move on. I love him and I want him to be happy. I can't start crying at the mere thought of him moving on. My former best friend is angry with me and has told our mutual friends that I have forbidden him from seeing her and that's why he didn't text her back or answer her calls. I said that this wasn't true and that I haven't had any contact with him since I moved out. I don't know if our friends believe me or her. I feel like I don't have the energy to care if they do or not. When everything settles down and everyone moves on, the ones that care about me will stay in my life. The rest, well, they're not worth being sad about losing. Not the jerk. She was disrespectful for those comments. Don't apologize because she isn't your friend. OP. I don't think she wants me anymore as a friend. If she ends up with him, she'll probably not want to be friends anymore. And if they don't, she will always think of my comment as the reason. She doesn't sound like a friend since she's been waiting to date him. If anything, she had been staying close to you just to have access to him. You need to make a clean break from her too. And how shallow is she that she thinks that her looks alone will be an equivalent to everything that you meant and still mean to your ex? Also, you need to make sure that you truly want a clean break with your ex. You can't go back and forth calling dibs on him. Everyone sucks here. Her way more than you. 
The way she dismissed, one, the fact that you still love him, and two, the unwritten rule that you don't date your friend's exes, and three, your polite and tactful comment that she wasn't his type just shows her true colors. If she's full of herself enough to say that she's never been rejected, she can stand to be knocked down a couple notches. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. Friends don't date friends' exes. Don't add me, bruh. Today I messed up by donating $15,000 to a poor community in Bangladesh instead of the $150 donation I intended. This happened in February last year, but my friends have been telling me I need to post this story online, so here goes nothing. My wife and I, both 31 years old at the time, moved into a new three-unit apartment building in San Francisco. One of our neighbors is a 70-something-year-old retired veteran. We'll call him Joe. For context, Joe is a white American guy and he's also a devout Hindu priest. One day, I run into Joe in my hallway and he tells me about this charity he manages for a community in Bangladesh. I wanted to support my neighbor and the charity, so I asked Joe to send me the GoFundMe link. The next day at work, I go on the GoFundMe page and I donate $150, or so I thought. Moments later, I get a text on my phone warning me of an unusually large transaction on my credit card. I'm confused and swipe to open the text message. It says I've made a payment of $15,041 to GoFundMe. Immediately, I'm sweating. How could I have donated $15,000? I spend the next 10 to 15 minutes retracing my steps and finally I realize my credit card starts with the numbers 4 and 1. It seems I had accidentally started typing my credit card information in while my cursor was still on the donation box. And just like that, $150 became $15,041. Yikes. I call GoFundMe support line in a panic, and when I finally connect with a human, I explain what happened. No need to worry, he tells me. They will initiate a refund of the transaction, which should process in 3 to 7 business days. That's a huge relief. But then I ask the agent if the charity will be able to see the donation on the GoFundMe page until it's refunded. What do you mean? The agent asks me. What do you mean, what do I mean? Was my response. Will they be able to see the $15,000 donation? Unfortunately, yes, the agent tells me. They will be able to see it until the refund process is complete. I tell him that's a big problem, as the entire GoFundMe had hardly raised that much at that point. Surely they will notice their fundraiser doubling overnight. My plan was to knock on Joe's door the following morning to give him the full story so that he could pass it along to his contacts in Bangladesh. But when I woke up the next morning, I looked at my phone and I saw that I had 40 plus notifications on Facebook. Someone had sent me a friend request, had liked many of my old posts, and had sent me many messages. Immediately I was concerned when I saw that the individual messaging me had a Hindu name, but I never could have imagined what I saw when I opened his first message. The man had sent me a video of himself from Bangladesh, surrounded by dozens of impoverished and hungry people holding bags of food, thanking me by name, Michael, for my generous donation. A big round of applause for Michael. At this point, I've leaped out of my bed and I'm pacing. Part of me wants to scream. Part of me wants to crack up laughing. I start swiping through the man's messages and it's picture after picture after picture of poor Bangladeshis thanking me for my kind donation. Literally hundreds of photos of frail, elderly, disabled, and malnourished individuals holding signs with my name. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Needless to say, I couldn't live with myself if I just donated $150 after seeing how the community responded to $15,000. I decided to at least add a zero, so I donated $1,500 once the original donation was refunded. The charity's host was incredibly gracious and understanding, and he explained to me that $1,500 goes very far in Bangladesh for urgent food relief. Here's the charity's new GoFundMe link if you want to check it out. Ultimately, I think the whole experience was a win-win. I helped a great cause, and I got a funny story out of it. Don't you just love a happy ending? We're including that GoFundMe link in the description of this video if you'd like to go help out. I keyed someone's car today because they parked poorly. Today, I got the most irrationally mad that I've been in a while. A friend ruined a concert for me last night. This morning, I woke up with a killer headache. I was running late for work, and my belt broke when I went to pull on it. A busy intersection on the way to work was choked down to one lane because of construction, so it took like 10 minutes to get through. And when I was waiting for the light, some jerk in a lifted pickup truck with a vanity license plate with something along the lines of monster on it. That's not what it said verbatim, but the same idea. They were proud jerks forced its way in front of a car in front of me, making me miss another light cycle. 
When I finally got to work, the parking lot was full, and I made my way to what appeared to be an open spot somewhere in the middle of it. But when I got there, I found that the car parked in one of the spots next to it was needlessly overlapping the line by about two feet. It clearly wasn't a case of the car next to them parking poorly and then pulling away, leaving them to look like jerks. No, they clearly turned into this parking space from the wrong direction and did nothing to straighten their car to fit in the spot. The spot that they were bleeding over into was on the driver's side, so it was clear when they left the vehicle that they were parked poorly and they still left it. Anyway, I had parked on the far corner of the parking lot, around 100 yards further. Even though 100 yards isn't far and I could have written it off, at that point I was blind with anger and was honestly considering going home because my headache was insane and I was worried that I'd come in too hot and get myself in trouble. I chose not to do that though. Walking to the front of the store, I had to pass the vehicle that had been parked poorly and impulsively I grabbed my keys from my pocket and dragged them as hard as I could across the entire back of the car as I walked by. I instantly realized how messed up that was and started regretting it. I walked straight back to the bathrooms in the store and I hid there for like 10 minutes to stop seeing red and then started my shift as if nothing had happened. The day went on as normal and nothing came of it. I know the cameras don't really cover that part of the parking lot and I did it in a way that I don't think was obvious so I don't think it will ever come back to me but I do feel bad about it. Update. I've slept on the incident and have come to a conclusion. I don't care. I didn't impact the vehicle's ability to operate and the damage can be completely ignored. If you're selfish enough to park like a jerk and not fix it, then maybe your vehicle should reflect that to warn other drivers and to show that you don't learn. Maybe your day deserves to be made a little bit worse for it. Forget them. The way they were parked showed that, at least, the spot they were mostly in and the spot they were overlapping were unoccupied when they parked. They could have easily parked better if they wanted to. If you're going to be selfish in a way that affects me, I'm going to be selfish in a way that affects you and use you to get rid of my anger so that I can be compassionate towards people who actually deserve compassion. That's the thing about doing crappy things in response to other crappy things. They end up making you feel worse, not better. Well, what do you think? Was OP justified in keying the car or not? Please let us know. Oh, it's all right. We've all keyed a few cars, haven't we? Uh, no. Today I messed up by going on a date with my friend. I went on a date with one of my friends whom I'll call Sarah, not her real name, that I attend the same university with. I've always known that my friend has a thing for me, but I've always been reluctant to go on a date with her because I genuinely value our friendship and felt putting romance there would just mess things up. About a week ago, I was hanging out with Sarah and our other mutual friend as they listened to me complain about my unfortunate dating history. The mutual friend then put out the idea of a date between Sarah and I. He did this mainly to just make the room temporarily awkward, but it led to a conversation where I essentially asked Sarah for a date. For the days leading up to the date, Sarah and I became a lot more flirty, and I have to admit, I was also excited for the date. Two days ago, I picked Sarah up, and we went to a fairly fancy restaurant. When the waiter came, I ordered my food. She then ordered basically three separate meals and I didn't know what to say or how to question why she had ordered so much food. When I finished my food, she barely ate half of one plate and she then said she wasn't actually hungry because she ate lunch right before she left her place. I asked her why then she ordered three meals and she said one is for her mom's dinner since she's always wanted to try this restaurant out and the other is for her to eat with her mom during dinner. I then told her that it's nice that she's getting dinner for her mom. It's cute that she would do that, to which she responded, I should be thanking you since you're paying. I had told her I would pay for the date, but I definitely never agreed to paying for her mom and her dinner when we had only gone out for lunch. The meal was expensive, but I would have been fine paying for her if she actually ate all three meals. Instead, it all just felt wrong to me. The rest of the date was ruined for me, and I was checked out for the rest of the date. I was just going through the motions. After I left her at her place, I went radio silent on her as I was still annoyed by what she did. Today, I wanted to just tell her that I think it's better we go back to being just friends, but as I opened our chat message, I read a message she sent me shortly after our date. She basically was thanking me for the date and then went on to pour out her feelings for me and say that she has loved me for years and the date was like a dream come true for her. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was, all that free food. I had to drive over to her place to try to explain as gently as possible that the feelings are not mutual, which resulted in her crying and screaming at me as to why I was flirting with her before the date and why I even asked her out on a date. I feel horrible. Update. Thank you for your replies. I've been reading them and I want to clarify a few things. Firstly, 
I think I messed up in going on this date with her knowing she had feelings for me and there's risk of losing a friend. When I asked her on the date, I reasoned that she's attractive and even though I didn't like her in that way, we technically should make a good couple, so I was willing to give it a shot. Which in hindsight, it was my mistake and I should have just stuck to my logic surrounding friends. Over the week, the flirtation came naturally and I was genuinely optimistic and excited for the date and definitely didn't intend on leading her on. Secondly, I paid for her meals. For me, the money wasn't the problem. It was the concept in itself that bothered me. I don't mind buying her things to take home. I have actually done it a few times before. But you don't do that on a date, nor without asking at least prior to ordering. I didn't mention the food thing when we spoke. Honestly, her reaction to me not reciprocating those feelings left me speechless, and she kicked me out of her house when she was crying and shouting at me. She was also mad it took me two days to reply to her confession of love. Lastly, last night before I slept, I talked to our mutual friend who had kind of helped in instigating this date, and he was telling me that when he spoke to her, she was a total mess, and talking about horrible things that concerned her safety, which makes me feel so much worse. I wish this date had never happened. I, female 37, am furious at my niece who's 19 for posting a picture of me online, but my sister doesn't want to get involved. Recently, there was a wedding in the family and I was one of the bridesmaids. I was getting ready at my sister's house, along with some of my other family members. It's important to note that the dress was a corset back and very, very annoying to put on, but my husband kindly watched a how-to video and said that he would be happy to help me get it on properly. The dress was causing a hassle and took much longer to put on than necessary, but eventually it was on and the wedding went smoothly. It was only after the wedding that I saw my niece, who's 19, had posted an album on Facebook with all the getting ready photos and scrolling through it, one was taken of my husband and I as we struggled to get the dress on. I would like to note here that my husband and I were in a private room when getting ready and the photo had been taken through the window. I had closed the curtains but clearly had left a gap that was enough for the photo to be taken. It's not a very modest photo at all. My husband was trying to get the ribbons done up and had his hands underneath it, trying to make sure that nothing was knotted or twisted from the inside. You can't see anything in the photo, but the dress is hitched up. I was furious immediately when I saw the photo. Why on earth would she post a photo of me like this? I confronted her and she said that first she posted it because she didn't have any other getting ready photos of me, and second, it showed mine and my husband's bond and that he was generously helping me. I told her that she had invaded our privacy in getting that photo, which is evidence enough I do not want it circulated. I also compared what she did to something a creep would do which is when it turned into a full-blown argument and my sister got involved. My sister said that I should be above name-calling and that my niece does not have to engage with someone who argues like a kid. She also said that it was my niece's personal social media and she can do what she wants with it. I said that it may be her social media, but a photo of me which I have rights over. Besides, it was taken and then posted without my consent. My sister said to take it up with the cops if I felt so strongly about it and then walked away. I'm not really sure what to do from here, but I just feel so creeped out. I feel involving the cops would be throwing fuel on the fire, so any advice on navigating this would be appreciated. Update. Something that I had neglected to mention in my initial post because I was worried it would end up being the topic of discussion is that I am a Muslim woman and I wear a hijab in day-to-day -day life. Maybe it helps people understand why I was so upset. In light of everyone's comments though, I thought that I had maybe been too emotional when talking to my niece. And I realized maybe I shouldn't have called her creepy, so I organized a coffee date with her and my sister at a local cafe so we could have more of a heart-to-heart. -heart. I decided not to include my husband because they might feel more comfortable if it were just women in the discussion. Now, I would like to note that my sister and her family are not religious, and my niece has never been religious, but she's always been around my family and is very aware of why I choose to dress modestly. She has never been disrespectful of this in the past, so I led with that. I said that I was upset because I felt like she had violated my privacy. I told her that it was always inappropriate to take a photo of someone through a closed curtain, but I felt even worse given that what she posted should not have been seen by anyone outside of who I felt comfortable with. Side note, for those who commented that I should just report it, that was the first thing I did and Facebook is allegedly still investigating, but the photo is still up. My niece's and sister's reaction was not what I expected at all. I went in hoping for a very honest and open discussion but they came right out the gate saying that they had spoken to one of my niece's friends who is studying law and she, who's in her 20s, says that given the photo was taken on my sister's property and through my sister's window into my sister's house, the photo legally belonged to my sister and by extension her family. 
No crime had been committed, seeing as the landholder had given her permission. I said that was illogical and would mean that any number of crimes could be committed so long as the landholder gives their permission. But my sister just said that that's the law, so I should take it up with the judge. It was like talking to a brick wall, so eventually I just got up, paid, and I left. My husband says that I can probably go to a lawyer and get a cease and desist letter or something along those lines, asking that the photo be deleted. But I'm just so upset right now. I'm struggling to even think straight. The relationship seems to be over given the total lack of respect, but I never thought it would be like this. I guess that my other option is the cops, but I don't want this to drag on for a million years. I know this isn't a happy ending, but the lesson for everyone is to always make sure your curtains are closed properly. My employee started a false rumor that two coworkers were having an affair. I'm a manager of a handful of frontline managers. One manager in particular, let's call her Emily, approached me the other day to tell me that one of the receptionists, Jane, came to her office and told her that there was a rumor going around the office that Emily was potentially having an affair with a new male coworker, John. Jane then told Emily in no uncertain terms that she expected the behavior to stop. The behavior being that they joke around with each other. Emily immediately began to investigate where the rumors were coming from and found it actually originated with Jane. She went through a rough couple of days when she just felt completely blindsided and sick about the whole thing. She's happily married and so is John. I've seen them interact many times and it's only ever seemed like two colleagues who banter back and forth together. I've never seen or heard anything that would raise concern. I've worked with Emily and John for a long time and their character is above reproach. I'm not concerned at all that there's anything to the rumor. Jane has been at the center of office gossip before. In fact, before she was concerned that Emily and John were having an affair, she felt like another coworker and John were getting too close. I've heard for the last few months that Jane feels she would be a better manager than Emily, and I wonder if this is her way of trying to get rid of Emily. I've never wanted Jane to be a manager. She's never shown in her attitude or behavior that she would be good at it, so she isn't on my radar when it comes to any kind of succession planning. I plan on speaking with Jane about unprofessional behavior and the company policy about not gossiping, and I plan on giving her an official warning on this subject. Is there anything else I can do? How should I word my conversation with her? Also, can I, in this same conversation, tell her that she will never be a manager under my downline, or would that just be piling on? Update. When Emily, the manager, told me what had happened, I did ask her how she wanted to handle it. We discussed our options and decided it was just time for Jane to go. She had gossip issues in the past that she was disciplined for. We knew it would take a bit of time to manage her out, but that was the plan. Because this was urgent, I spoke to Jane, the troublemaker, the very next day and said similar things to what Allison recommended. I don't interact daily with Emily's team as I have other locations I'm responsible for, but I have a reputation for generally being easygoing. I think when I spoke to Jane, she was surprised at how matter-of-fact and assertive I was. There was no friendly banter. I told her that what she had done was completely unacceptable and that her behavior would not be allowed in the office. I discussed with her how rumors of this nature can destroy reputations and careers and Emily and I no longer trusted her. I did tell her that she had a long uphill battle of gaining trust back in the office and that all the effort in the world may never result in trust being restored. She was upset at this point, not angry, which is what I expected, but she was crying, not at all what I expected. I asked her if she thought she felt she could earn back the trust which was broken and if she felt that she could move forward. She said she had been looking at other jobs and said maybe she should quit. I told her that would be up to her, but I encouraged her to do so. She decided that would be best. I wasn't interested in having her work for her last two weeks, so I had her write a letter of resignation, let her gather her things, and that was that. I did process her out as though she gave two weeks so she wouldn't lose all of her vacation time that we pay out when proper notice is given. I thought for sure she would be combative in the meeting and I thought she would argue with me. I was surprised by the outcome, but glad I didn't have to go through the couple week process of managing her out officially. I found out Jane got a new job a couple weeks later as a manager. After a couple of months, we heard from another staff member that Jane was telling people how angry she was that when she said she would just quit, that we didn't try to talk her out of it. She didn't understand why we just let her go. Guy lied about his credentials online. I contacted the departments he allegedly studied at and they all said they didn't know him. A guy I got into a row with on a Facebook group lied about his credentials online when he felt threatened by me and started spewing nonsense about how I'm probably not a graduate of the school that's written on my Facebook and my professional page. Prior to this, he was very rude, crass, 
and disrespectful to people that call him out on his BS. Instead of defending himself properly, he'll result to childish insults and personally attacking you when he has nothing else to back up his claims. He claims to be a religious educator, yet his actions show anything but religious. Anyway, he made the mistake of giving out his ID number and degree at School A, where a close friend of mine graduated, and his program that he was currently taking in School B, where I graduated and I'm close with the program secretary when we were having a row. A quick Google search also connected me to his LinkedIn, where he has indeed listed both schools down, but it's very inconsistent with the entry and graduation dates he gave me. I let it slide for a day after the argument simmered down, but this morning I noticed he took a very obvious jab at me at the same Facebook group we bickered at. It was written in our language, but it roughly translated to, there's this one person here in the comments section that allegedly graduated from a prestigious university, but her personality is trash. As a naturally petty person, I obviously did not let this slide. First course of action. I messaged the department in School B he was supposedly taking his master's degree in, reporting him by giving them what happened, the screenshots of just how rude, crass, and disrespectful he is. I also gave them his full name, which I slewed on my own, the year he supposedly entered the school and the program he was taking. The answer from the program secretary? Hi, OP. Good afternoon. Mr. V is not a student. Thank you for raising this concern. We'll look into this matter. Satisfaction. Second course of action. I messaged the department he supposedly finished his bachelor's from in school A. I gave them his full name, alleged ID number, the bachelor's degree he allegedly finished from this school, the years he was allegedly active at this school, as well as the same screenshots. The answer from the dean himself. I don't know him and he's never been my student. Satisfaction. I'm biding for the right time to show these messages from the two departments for when he acts up again so I can finally shut him up for good. But wow, the satisfaction was unreal. Furthermore, when I changed my picture to a picture of me and my toga, which is very distinct because of my university logo, he also changed his picture to him posing at a public place in my university where literally anyone can go without a problem since it was a Catholic church, and you can go there anytime as long as it's daylight to pray or reflect. Sorry this got so long, I really needed a place to share my petty revenge. Update. The dude was apparently stalking my Facebook account and stumbled across a My Day post. I posted about how I contacted the department and how they all said they didn't know him, and now he's blowing up my messages, telling me they probably aren't said departments. Anyway, lots of people who know him also saw my post and asked who it's about. Told them it's him, and apparently he's mad that I exposed him online. Update 2. Found out the dude completely plagiarized a paper, and the paper was originally written by a friend of mine. Well, looks like he really did himself in. I'll wait this one out and see where it goes. Am I the jerk for not giving my son money from my daughter's savings? I'm 56, female, and my daughter, who's 29, still lives at home. My daughter was nervous about living on her own, and after college, she asked if she could come back home until she was ready. With the prices of houses right now and how dangerous the world has become, my husband and I decided it was best if she stayed at home. She doesn't know when she plans on moving out, but she isn't in any rush, and me and my husband don't plan on rushing her either. She pays us rent once a month. Her only other bills are the stuff for her cat and what she chooses to do with her own time. My husband had the idea to save the money she was giving us as rent and give it all back to her when she's about to move out as a surprise. My daughter does not know that we've been saving her rent money. Recently, my son, 31, male, and his wife have been house hunting. They haven't found anything in their budget that fits their needs. They're short on money and recently found out about what me and my husband have been doing with our daughter's rent money. Recently, he and his wife sat me and my husband down while our daughter was at work and asked us to give them the money we've been putting aside for our daughter. I told them no because it wasn't our money to give away and that it belongs to his sister. He argued that she wasn't moving out anytime soon and he and his wife needed the money now. I offered to gift him some money, but it wasn't nearly as much as the amount of money my daughter's rent money has created over the last seven years that she's been living with us. My son said that if we gave him the money, that me and my husband could just slowly put the money back over the next couple of years. I told him that me and my husband doing that would put us in a financial strain. We aren't struggling by any means, but the amount of money set aside for my daughter is too much to just put back. He and his wife accused me of favoring my daughter. I told them that wasn't true because he had the opportunity to live at home and save up for a house, but he chose not to live at home after college. 
I tried my best to explain to them that I couldn't just give away money that didn't belong to me. He and his wife angrily left after I refused to budge on the matter. Am I the jerk for not giving away my daughter's money? Not the jerk. They sure are entitled. I can't believe they declined money from you not related to the money your daughter has paid you in rent. That's ridiculous. Their financial situation is their responsibility and choice, and you are not required to give them anything, especially when it takes money from your daughter who has been paying you each month. Am I the jerk for giving my dad his money back in front of his other kids and telling him he was no longer welcome at my graduation? My graduation ceremony is being held next week. My dad has given me some money in advance to pay for the party. I live mostly with my mom, but they were supposed to be hosting the event together. Dad and I have a rocky relationship. After my parents divorced when I was four, they split custody of me and he was able to stay a good dad. When I was 10, he met Jane. Jane had three kids, twins and a single kid. They got married when I was 12, but I would say even before that, I felt like he prioritized her kids over me a lot. He would cancel plans with me if they wanted to do something and would either do the thing with them or force me to go and say it was even better than our plans, when for me it wasn't. Think going for a hike with me versus taking them to an indoor play area, or seeing a movie with me versus the kiddie park. One more example is when I was given a ticket for a concert my dad and I both love. He was supposed to buy a ticket to come with me for some father-son time, but actually spent it on his youngest stepkid who wanted their room painted. He told me at the last minute and it hurt. There are other times stuff like this happened too. He didn't show up at the hospital when I broke my arm because one stepkid was getting their tonsils out and wanted both him and his wife there. He told my mom over the phone to tell me he was proud of me for being brave and understanding even though I never said that. When I would bring this stuff up to tell him, he'd tell me it was natural to feel jealous of sharing his attention. That was all he would say. In 2019, he told my mom he would split the cost of a trip I wanted to go on with one of my clubs because she didn't have the money all by herself. Mom had her half saved. We told my dad he needed to pay. He said bills were tight and it was the twins' birthdays and the money needed to go on something for them. He told me we could do something as a family when the trip happened instead. I told him to forget it, that he was making it clear who was more important and I was going to stay with my mom where I actually mattered. Mom borrowed money to cover the other half of the trip. Dad told me he regretted making me feel less important and we were working on things and then the graduation money was given about a month ago. Then a week ago, he called me and told me how one of the stepkids was being bullied, how bad of a time they're having, and with that money, they could help cheer them up for their birthday. I was upset. I hung up. Then two days later, I showed up at his doorstep, gave him the money back, and told him I didn't want to see him or his new family at my graduation, and that he had chosen who was more important so he better stay out of my life. His stepkids and two younger biological kids were there. I didn't stick around. He called and told me we needed to talk it out like adults and that I had hurt the kid's feelings. His wife freaked out on me, so I blocked her. Am I the jerk? As a mom with kids from two marriages, I will say absolutely not the jerk. Your dad consistently and constantly chose everyone else above you. This is not okay. Making and breaking promises is disgusting. Saying one thing and then backing out is gross. And asking for the money back? No, just no. He is not a father, he's a spineless donor who deserves nothing from you. You needed a father and he was absolutely not it, and I'm sorry. Stalker Karen lies about dating my brother, gets what she deserves. I, 17 female, have 8 older brothers. Without going too much into detail, there's a few adoptions and half-siblings in the mix, but I'm close to all of them, and while my life can be crazy sometimes, I wouldn't trade them for the world. It's also relevant that I don't have either of my parents in my life and haven't since I was 11. The issue involves my close friend, who's 17, who I've known since we were four. For about a year now, she's been consistently posting on social media about her best friend's super hot older brothers and the terrible tale of how she ended up in a love triangle with her best friend's brothers. It's seriously annoying. She's never really had anything to do with my brothers. They know her as my little sister's friend and nothing more so I really don't get where all of this is coming from. Over the last few weeks, however, it's gotten so much worse. She actively tells stories to people at our school about the steamy romance that's in her life, and it's bringing me a lot of unwanted attention. I've tried to talk to her about it, but she always says that she'd never do anything to hurt me and she's just living her life, which doesn't even make sense. I've mentioned it so many times that I've started to avoid hanging out with her, 
because I know my brothers will come into it and I'll have to ask her to knock it off again. Everything came to a head yesterday. We went out with some friends and four of my brothers dropped us both off. When we got inside, half of the girls in the group immediately started looking to my best friend about the good-looking guys in the car and whether those were the hot guys she was always talking about. I snapped and yelled, those are my brothers, and I swear, if you don't stop using my life to get petty clout, I'm cutting you off. Quit living your fantasy through me. Do it somewhere else. And I left, which I feel like was really harsh, and I probably could have waited until we were in private. She called me later to tell me she wanted space from our friendship because I had become jealous, needy, and controlling ever since she got close with my brothers, which isn't even remotely true. All of my brothers so far have told me to just stop being friends with her, but she's been really important in my life for a long time and I don't want to ruin what we have. But at the same time, I don't want to keep letting her use my life for her fantasy. Am I the jerk? Did you check with your brothers to make sure that there was no hookup or anything misconstrued? OP. I have said that I already spoke to them and they were disgusted to say the least. My brothers are all in their 20s. She's also never been around them long enough for something like that to have happened. How does she act when your brothers are around? OP. She's always been flirty with them, which they never reciprocated, and eventually they stopped being around when I had her over because of the comments. She isn't close with them at all, and I've asked her a few times to stop, but she never does. The one time I asked her why she was doing this, she told me to stop being controlling, so I really don't know where this is coming from. I don't know the full deal with my parents. Even when they were around, they weren't really active in my life, but when I was 11, they lost a custody battle for me. Why are you friends with her? OP. I've been friends with her for over 10 years, so it's not easy to let that go. Plus, she's the only friend I have. I have friendly acquaintances, but no other friends. She only started acting like this about a year ago, and I thought it was normal, I guess. So I didn't really do anything because it didn't really hurt anybody. Or at least I thought it didn't. Update. So the first thing I did was have a proper talk with my brothers about everything that's been going on. I showed them the post and all of the comments I received, and they took a minute to read them before speaking. One of my brothers, Sam, assured me that they had never been flirty, romantically interested, etc. with my friend at any point in time. Not gonna lie, that made everything so much easier. I was terrified one of them was going to admit to me that they hooked up or something. We also talked about her recent behavior. I told them about what she'd been saying, and then Sam spoke up. He said that in the past, they had heard my friend intentionally telling people strange things about me in order to make it seem like I wasn't a person who you'd want to be friends with. They overheard these conversations at my house when I wasn't around or doing something else and she was waiting for me. Things like, she's too clingy, or she's controlling. It hurt me a lot. You guys were right, she's been isolating me from people. After our talk, I needed to get some air, so I went out for a walk. My friend ended up calling me and I answered. I know, stupid, but I was hurt and wanted to know if she really had done those things. The conversation went like this. Her. Listen, OP. We've been friends for a long time, and I don't want to hurt you, but this friendship has become really toxic. Me. Are you serious? I know what you've been saying about me. You're a liar and a creep, and the only toxic thing in this friendship is you. Her. I've literally never lied to you in your life, so I don't know what you think I've said or done, but you're wrong. It's not my fault people don't want to be your friend because you're weirdly possessive. Me. You literally told people you were dating my brothers. That's gross and really messed up. See, this is what I mean. You aren't acting like yourself anymore. I feel like ever since we got older, you've started to become obsessed with attention. I don't like this version of you. It isn't my best friend. I hung up after that and now I feel like crap. She was my best friend. I have no idea what to do next because she hasn't stopped blowing up my phone since the call. I want to block her, but I just can't do it. I feel like an absolute failure. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I don't have a clue what I'm going to do next, but I want to tell her parents, but what would I even say? Your daughter is obsessed with my brothers? I have literally no evidence whatsoever, and I don't know what she's told them about me. Who knows? Any advice would be appreciated since my brain isn't working right now, and all I've been doing is crying. Update. Long story short, I called my ex-friend and I told her the following. I don't want you in my life anymore. And that was it. I know some people told me to set her reputation on fire, because why not? But I feel like that would do more harm than good. And if she ever does grow up, I'm sure she doesn't want this whole drama fest to be tied to her forever. The first few days after that phone call were hectic. 
I couldn't stop crying, which made me feel pathetic, and I overall just felt lost. I haven't really made friends at school. Most people think of me as a weirdo who dropped her best friend of 10 years because she was jealous of her own brothers. So I guess lunch in the bathrooms from now on. I also got calls from my ex-friend's sister who called me some names and ranted about how my brothers loved ex-friends so much and that I was such a cow for separating them. So I guess she's sticking to her story. So yeah, that's kind of it. I'm just spending time with myself and my bed. Today I messed up by letting an Instagram sugar daddy pay off my credit card. So I'm passively doom scrolling on Instagram when I receive a DM from a man whom I don't know. I am no stranger to the scammers on Instagram, the ones who message you and say they want to help you out. I've always ignored them as they're obvious scams, but today was different, call it a lapse in judgment or a sudden loss of brain cells. I receive a message from a man who seemed nice enough, had a thought out profile with photos and stories, not your typical fake profile. We start chatting back and forth and things seem normal. Then this man asks me to be his sugar baby. Immediately I tell him that I A. Have no money B. Have no intention of sending him any money and C. Am not interested in being scammed. Of course he launches into a grandiose speech about how he had never scammed me or even asked me for money. That he'll be paying me so there's no need for me to be worried. Apprehensively I agree to keep talking to him. We exchange phone numbers and begin texting back and forth. A few days go by and we're chatting regularly. I talk to him about work, his day. He asks me about my day. Things largely seem benign. At this point, I'm assuming I've met a lonely old man who's looking for some attention. We never talked about hooking up or anything and he seemed to take a genuine interest in my life. Fast forward to a few days later, he texts me and tells me he's going to pay off my credit card debt, which we had previously talked about. I ask him how he intends to do so and he becomes insistent on logging into my credit card account and adding his bank account information as the form of payment. Initially, I was incredibly reluctant. Rule 1 of basic cybersecurity would dictate that anyone asking for my personal information should not be given said information. However, there I sat weighing the risks and rewards. A young college student with a sizable amount of debt from living expenses, over $2,000, and a man seemingly willing to pay it all off. So I run the risk, I give him the login information and I sit anxiously as I ponder all of the ways this man could ruin my life. Then the pending payment was posted and I receive email confirmation. Immediately I change my password and I thank him profusely. After a day or two the payment clears and my card is paid off. The euphoria I felt in that moment is unmatched. We continue talking back and forth for about two weeks, cut to last night at about 1am. I'm texting him about his weekend and he asks me to run an errand for him. This is where the feeling in my gut that something was wrong started. Then he starts telling me that he needs gift cards for crypto trading, that I need to get the gift cards for him because I'm the only one he can trust, that once I purchased the cards with my credit line, he would pay it all back just as he did before. Naturally, I begin to ask questions. Why do I specifically need to purchase the cards? Why can't he purchase them for himself? How many does he need, etc.? Quickly, his patience runs thin. He begins pressuring me to purchase the cards and telling me that I owe him for paying off my card. Finally, I tell him outright, no, that I'm uncomfortable and that he had promised I wouldn't ever have to pay any fees or give him any money. Then he got very angry. I'm not well educated on the sugar daddy dynamic, but I do know that no one would ask anyone to do something of this nature unless they're into some shady business. Either he's scamming me or laundering money. Regardless, I didn't want to be involved. The man begins to ask for his money back, saying that if I don't pay him back in 24 hours, he'll make me regret it. I ask him how he wants to receive payment and he provides an email I do not recognize. It was then that I realized I messed up. I start panicking and shaking. At first, I considered just sending the money and having it all over with. I was so embarrassed about the debt and terrified of my parents finding out. Ultimately, I knew I didn't have the money. In fact, I never had the money at all. I wasn't given the money to pay the card. He added the payment to the account himself. So I deleted every social media I had and changed every password to everything I own. I blocked his phone number and began thinking of any information he really had on me and what he could do with it. Unfortunately, this man was persistent. I began receiving texts from the email telling me I'm not gonna be smart and run away with his money. I was so terrified, I began pretending that I was my own parent and that I was confused as to why he was trying to contact me. 
For some reason, he bought it. We interact briefly and he tells me that I need to talk to my kid and get him his money in 24 hours or he'll be opening an FBI case. I then reach a realization. I need to actually tell my parents. So I text them at the early hour of 3 a.m. telling them I messed up badly. We call and I tell them everything about the debt and the man and the threats, all of it. Now I've come clean and my parents are helping me pick up the pieces and figure out the next step. Hard lesson learned, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I work for a credit card company and I've been in the fraud department for around 7 years. What happened to you is a pretty common scam. The payment they made is going to bounce in a few days due to insufficient funds. The scam was initially to try and get gift cards using your credit card. Once that didn't work, he's now attempting to bully you into giving him money. He's a scammer. Call your bank and report fraud, then ghost the dude. There will be no FBI investigation on you. Don't trip. I feel like my life is falling apart after receiving my inheritance. Where do I even begin? I'm so lost right now. I don't even know how to put things into words or find a good starting point. I guess it goes with how two months ago, my life was exactly where I wanted it to be. I've been with the girl of my dreams, who's 27, for the last three and a half years. We have a house, animals, both of our families get along beautifully. And honestly, the last three years with her and my family and her family around the holidays have been some of the most warm, fuzzy memories I've had in my entire life. And believe me, I've been thinking about those times a lot lately. So, like I said, this problem is going to come in parts because my entire life feels like it's on the brink of completely falling apart. My mother was a very, very wealthy woman. Most of her life, she and I did not get along very well, but I started working in the family business roughly five years ago, and since then, we've actually developed a great relationship. It was one of those things where, after many years of feeling that my mother hated me, she was at last proud of me and not afraid to say that she loved me and valued me. Then, last month in mid-March, she passed away. I'm tearing up thinking about this as I type because I've always felt that, despite her resentment towards me in my early years, I loved my mother more than anyone else in the world. I won't say much more than that. She had a hard life in spite of her wealth, and I feel I could write a whole book on our relationship. Anyway, she's gone, and my siblings and I are now extremely wealthy and have taken possession of the business and all of her investments and property. If that isn't scary enough, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I need to do next. The business I was associated with, I can handle, and my siblings and I have really come together on this, and they seem to trust me with that part of it. But it doesn't wash away the hurt and guilt that I feel that I only got a few good years with the woman who gave me life. Anyway, my plan is to marry my girlfriend by next year, and we've already discussed the prenup situation, which I will be getting due to my newfound wealth. She has been nothing but wonderful after my mom's passing, but the problems come in her family. I won't go into much detail, but I love these people like an extension of my own family, but they have already started trying to pry exactly how wealthy I am out of my girlfriend and her mom has always had a gravitational pull towards, for a lack of a better term, pyramid schemes. Her first sibling, Terry, just got married and is working at a fast food job. Terry and his wife have decided that they will be starting a family soon and stated that they want wife to be a stay-at-home mom. This talk has only recently popped up and been brought to my attention and I feel like I'm being paranoid been directed at me, as there's absolutely no way they'd be able to afford this on the money they currently make, or even while living in their small apartment. Like, they're expecting me to help them out in a situation they are wholly unable to handle right now. Sibling number two, Leslie, has run into some pretty serious legal trouble and is also pregnant. The father has a history of mistreatment and neither have steady incomes. They've recently come back into our lives after a four-year-long absence between girlfriend and Leslie. Though prior to this, the two have always been extremely close, as girlfriend is with all of her siblings, as throughout their childhood, a lot of the time, all they had were each other. Sibling number three, Casey, who I hardly ever speak to, has even started chatting me up on Facebook more than she ever has in the entire time I've known her. Is this just my brain devolving into paranoia, or is this actually happening? Like the lottery horror stories you hear, where people come out of the woodwork with their hands out when they smell money on someone they know. I know for a fact my mother, for all of her faults, fell victim to this when she inherited this money. She became increasingly bitter throughout her life due to all of the husbands and friends that took advantage of her for what she could do for them. She drank herself stupid every day for 30 plus years and moved through carton after carton of cigarettes and alienated her own kids. I don't want to be like that. I don't want that to happen. 
It's been less than a month that I've had more money than I know what to do with, and I'm afraid to spend a dime or do anything with it because I feel like my girlfriend's family is only the beginning. What's worse, and will probably make me look like a total jerk, is my girlfriend has already committed to helping Leslie. They were close their whole lives, and with all of the legal trouble and pregnancy, girlfriend cries at night thinking about what's happening to her. She's not asked me to help financially or anything, but I have been there every step of the way to help support them and her as best as I can. But how will it look when my girlfriend starts giving out her money to people while I don't and get viewed as a selfish Scrooge? All of this is too much. The last three years were just so wonderful. So many magic trips to the beach, wonderful holidays, surrounded by not one, but two families full of great people that accepted and loved me. And now it seems like, because I lost my mother and am getting a windfall because of it, everything is changing. I don't get to be happy with family anymore, and my whole life is crashing because of this. I know this is so far beyond a first world problem. Poor baby is now a multimillionaire and a little sad he can't have a happy Christmas, wah wah, but I feel so broken. I miss my mom, I don't sleep at all, I hardly eat, and despite knowing full well the path my mother went down, I've been drinking a bit and smoking more than I ever had. On a daily basis, in fact. My siblings seem to be coping just fine, and now I feel like everyone is out to get me. Even my girlfriend is getting a little tired of hearing me voice my concerns over girlfriend siblings one through three, and her mom's sudden extra interest in me, which is understandable. They are all very close and take up for one another. Now I'm even doubting myself and thinking it's all in my head, maybe. Too many times my mother drunkenly telling me about all the times she trusted people and was let down. I'm just so lost. Update. I'm not sure if it's worth writing a whole update, but last night I called my sister and drove an hour to her house and stayed the night with her, her husband, and my nieces and nephew. Over some beers, she and I started talking about the whole situation. Oddly, it's the first time we've really talked about anything alone without attorneys or my other siblings around since my mom passed. It turns out she isn't as together about everything as I thought she was. I showed her the thread and all of the replies, and both she and I agreed to talk to a financial advisor and look into getting attorneys to help us with this. She had been primarily working with my mom's attorney up until now. I'm going to look into setting up a trust as well. Nothing too crazy, but enough that I can give small gifts to these people and have a cap on it, so to speak, for whenever it does come up. I talked to my girlfriend on the phone this morning and kind of laid it all out, and she was in total agreement. She said she was surprised Casey had suddenly started talking to me and that it was very suspicious. She also said that Terry's wife brought up the kids again and was showing her houses they wanted to get that were way out of their price range, and my girlfriend kind of played dumb and just kept asking questions about how they planned to afford all that. So I know that she and I, at least for now, are on the same page. Lastly, when I was talking to my sister last night, she said something both uplifting and that destroyed me. We were talking about our mom, and my sister said that one of the last conversations she had with our mom, my mother said, you and your brother trust OP. He knows what he's doing and he will make sure everyone is okay. Anyway, thank you all again for all of your comments. I feel like a better and stronger person just one day later. It's crazy that people assume you will give them any money. I'd set up trusts for the kids, maybe, and not give the parents any cash. If you do, they'll just keep asking for more. That or move away and tell them it's all locked up in investments and you can't touch it. Absolutely bonkers to think that your sibling spouse owes you anything. Like, they're assuming you're going to buy them a whole house? The entitlement is insane and disgusting. It's definitely going to ruin your and your fiancé's relationship with the family if the siblings don't stop. Am I the jerk for being upset with the clothes my granddaughter wore on her way out of the maternity ward? I know this sounds silly, but I would like an outside opinion and accept any judgment. I have four kids and five grandkids. For all of my grandkids, I made knitted clothes and hats for them to come out of the maternity ward. It started with my first granddaughter and all of the ones that followed. My kids kept asking me to do it. It's customary in my country for clothes to be a certain color to represent something good, health, peace, and protection. I don't do it professionally, and I work, so it's something I do in my spare time and it takes months because I do it with all the love and care. Nor do I force the kids to accept it. Most ask right after they announce the pregnancy if I can make the clothes. My oldest daughter, I'll call Pam, announced that she was pregnant and asked me to make it for her daughter. We found out later. Clearly I did. She chose the color red, and honestly, it was one of the prettiest jobs I've ever done, and I finished within seven months of her pregnancy. She gave birth about 20 days ago. My granddaughter was born healthy, perfect, and bright. 
I was heartbroken on the way out of the maternity ward when I found out that my granddaughter would not wear what I had made, but one that Pam got her from in-laws from a very expensive brand like Gucci. I didn't say anything to her, but in a conversation with my son, I just vented that I was heartbroken about it and that I wouldn't have any problems if she just hadn't asked and I hadn't had done it. But I only said this because he kept asking me what was wrong. Then word spread among my kids until it reached Pam in the form of a scolding from someone else. She called me angrily, saying that she didn't believe I was this jealous of clothes and that her daughter could wear whatever she wanted to, but that I decided to make this moment about me and not celebrating my granddaughter's life. I'm lost. I'm just heartbroken that I've been making something so lovingly for months for a specific moment and not been told at any point that she wouldn't use it. My family is divided. Some are criticizing me and others are on my side. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Everyone's saying there's still time to wear the outfit. They're missing the point. The outfit was for a specific event. If you had been asked to make a prom dress and spend hours and hours of your free time to make it only for your daughter to wear a different dress to prom, no one would say she can still wear it some other time. Similar situation here. While I agree that it would have been better that this news didn't get to her from a third party, it's understandable that you aren't as comfortable speaking with your daughter-in-law as you are your son. This is how my family works. Most often, my in-laws speak to my wife and my family speaks to me about issues. Today I messed up by using Zipcar. This happened today. My girlfriend and I live in separate apartments in Brooklyn, but we share a storage unit near her place. I'd gotten a Zipcar subscription for a trip last month, which left me with a monthly fee that I was looking to justify. So I reserved a car for an hour and a half to go pick up some of my stuff. That's a half hour to get there, a half hour to pack, and a half hour to lug the stuff up to my place. This will become important later. I apparently took longer than anticipated packing things up, and as I'm pulling up to my place, I realize that the meter on my reservation is nearly up. Don't really love that you have to anticipate your trip down to the minute, but figure they'll just charge me for an extra hour and it'll cost me another $15. Boy, was I wrong. Parking is scarce, so I double park, throw on the hazards, exit the car, shut the driver's side door, and go to start unloading my stuff. Hmm, this is odd. I didn't lock the car, and yet the door doesn't open. I know, I'll use my phone to unlock it. You use the Zipcar app to unlock their rentals. Hmm, that's strange. The doors remain locked. This is when I start to realize that when the reservation for your Zipcar runs out, they don't just hit you with a fee, they unceremoniously lock you out of the car completely. So here's this car, double parked on a busy road, blocking some other poor guy's car in, with all of my stuff inside of it. And the best part? My cat's in there. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I'd spent the night at my girlfriend's and brought my cat to stay with us. After shoving all of my stuff into the car, I'd loaded Kinko in for the trip back to my place. So now she's trapped inside, locked in her carrier on the first official day of summer. I call Zipcar. I grit my teeth and calmly explain the situation to an insufferably chipper customer service representative for a company that I'm beginning to suspect doesn't have my best interests at heart. I tell her that her company has locked my things inside of their car. I tell her that the company has locked my cat inside of their car. I tell her that it's hot out. She asks for my ID number. I tell her that her company has locked my ID inside of their car. She asks for the last four digits of my credit card. I tell her that that's locked inside too. She says something along the lines of, well, that's a pickle. It's around this time that I'm approached by an elderly man who announces himself as the owner and operator of the car, which is now obstructed by this immobile rental car. He asks if I could kindly move the vehicle because he's experiencing a medical episode and is about to drive himself to the emergency room. I explain to the customer service rep that there's now a very real chance that a courteous elderly bystander is in trouble because our company has decided to suddenly, and without warning me, transform the car I had rented into a large and movable hunk of junk. I tell her that this is completely unacceptable. She thinks this over. She asks if I can hold. A minute goes by, then two, five, ten. I'm freaking out now. Something must be done. The garage where I was supposed to drop off the car is actually very close to my apartment. I run to it. I find an attendant there, and I told him the story albeit with less color than you read now. I ask him to unlock the car. He tells me he might get fired if he does. I tell him that there are lives on the line, that the fate of an elderly man and a very good cat rest in his hands. He stares off into space, and for a moment, I can almost see the conflict inside of him. He looks back at me. 
He asks where the car is. Soon my cat is free and an elderly man tragically drives himself to the emergency room. Oh, and the late fee I expected? It was easily more expensive than the entire trip. Forget you, Zipcar. My parents apologized, my sister did not, at least at first. My last Am I the Jerk post essentially opened a Pandora's box into my family. Basically, my parents and older sister had become very comfortable with me helping with the childcare of my young triplet nephews. I didn't leave home till I was 22 because I was trying to save money while also going to college. A scholarship covered a lot and living at home kept me from getting rising debt due to my working part-time job as well. I'm very thankful for this. However, after college, everyone just seemed to act like I had endless time on my hands and convinced me along on a family vacation. In this so-called vacation, I was forced to babysit my three six-year-old nephews. I even had to share a hotel room with them. And believe me, those kids did not listen to a darn thing I said on the first night until I called their mother. Twice. And I was treated like the bad guy for wanting to do other things during the trip. Like, if it's something the family doesn't enjoy as a whole, then it doesn't happen. Which was extremely hypocritical because I'm family and wasn't included in that vote. And you can bet I aired this grievance with my parents after my last post. And they have acknowledged being in the wrong. After that awful vacation last year, I decided it was time to move out. And did so before the summer even ended which surprised everyone as I gave them no warning. I landed a great job pretty much right after college thanks to an internship and used moving as an excuse to drop my commute from 45 minutes to 15. My sister hated this the most because it meant no more free babysitting on weekends, but she still tried to make me do it. I caved sometimes, usually by being bribed with pizza, and this sort of became a new norm. But then last month, my parents announced plans for another family vacation to the same place along the coast and they basically wanted it to go the same way. I immediately saw it for what it was, a trap. I knew that if I rode with my parents and let them buy the hotel rooms, I would be done over the same way as last time. So I just casually stated I'd drive myself and pay for myself, and that's when the crap storm started. When my parents realized they couldn't entrap me like before, they resorted to borderline begging, and my sister practically tried to order me to go with the flow through gaslighting. Newsflash, I didn't. After I didn't cave to my sister's demands, I made the Am I the Jerk post after days of harassment, and then my sister somehow spotted that post in less than an hour. What followed was Pandora's box. At first, the family was against me. My sister called our parents, and they called me when I still had a little time to talk in the morning. My parents were on the phone with me while also reading my post. I asked them if anything in the post was a lie. They sort of steered around it and called the post an exaggeration but I pointed out numerous details that made it pretty much on the mark. Then I told them to check the comments. There were already far too many to read. I was repeatedly refreshing the page on my home PC and telling them how many comments there were. Then I told them that I was sick of their mentality of keeping the peace by forcing me to placate my sister. Then I said I was out of time and we would have to resume this later. Well, my parents were positively horrified that hundreds, if not thousands of people were commenting in a matter of hours. And later on, I told them that the numbers had basically doubled and were still growing, which only added to their horror. So I guess they were forced to take a long look at their own actions. My sister tried to call me to complain while I was at work, but my phone was on silent till my lunch break, so all she could do was leave messages and texts. But she was very persistent and managed to get through to me when I was eating lunch. The gist of the conversation was my post had taken our parents away from her side, and now they were mad at her. In the ensuing argument between them, my parents canceled the entire vacation. Yes, they later acknowledged they just passed the blame out of embarrassment and have fully accepted fault. They told me no excuses could excuse the fact they made me go there to be their go-to free babysitter when I wasn't even living at home anymore. They did try to backtrack a little by pointing out that they never charged me rent while I was in college, but I reminded them kids don't ask to be born and I was doing my hardest to make my own way. Then I pointed out my father had the same kind of leg up from his parents. They let him live free of charge at home while he was in college. That basically ended any argument my parents had left. When my sister managed to call me at lunch, I presented the facts to her and she showed her true colors. She implied that I have no life and that my free time on weekends should be spent helping her because she's tired and unable to even go out without bringing her kids with her unless someone's watching them. She's a stay-at-home mother with a husband that makes a decent salary. They live in a pretty decent house that's owned, not rented, and to be frank, my nephews aren't really my responsibility. 
They just forced them on me and expected it to stay that way. My sister angrily hung up on me, but I'd recorded the call and then played it for my parents later. They were furious and they basically went to war with my sister. My sister dug her heels in, blamed me, and then doubled down on her belief that my life should circle around hers. I told her that was the most narcissistic and entitled thing she's ever said about me. It took days, but her husband finally stepped in and forced her to apologize to me. I've never seen her cowed like that by anyone, but she was on the verge of crying. It ended up being admitted that one of the reasons I was the go-to babysitter was because my sister didn't trust strangers. It was never about the money, or was it? Actually, my brother-in-law thought my sister was paying me for the time watching her kids after I moved out of my parents' house. She didn't even give me gas money, just gave me cash that was enough to order pizza for myself and the kids and pocketed the rest. My sister had been shortchanging me for months. He blew up at her when this came out during her apology and she was forced to pay me what she owed me in cash entirely from her own savings, which she looked very sad about. Then my brother-in-law apologized to me for his own inaction and in letting my sister walk all over me and promised they'd get a normal babysitter from now on. Yes, it'll cause a bit of a drop in the bucket for them, but my sister will be getting date nights back. Then came the family meeting the other day. We all gathered up at my parents' house and everything was laid bare. Apologies all around and whatnot. Then my parents reinstated the family vacation and yes, I still plan to drive myself and pay for my own hotel stay. I'll even stay in a completely different hotel if my sister tries to revert me to childcare. And I've stated this. She's promised me that won't happen. And if I don't update again after the vacation in another month or two, then you'll know everything is fine. Karen charges us extra for something that didn't even happen, so we completely tanked her online reviews. This happened a few years ago. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I used to vacation in Asheville, booking cabins through a small rental company. We grew up there and loved it, plus she had friends and family in the area that we would visit while we were there. One of the rules the company had was that no extra guests were allowed to stay overnight or there would be a fee. This rule never bothered us as we never planned on having that. But we did invite a couple of my girlfriend's friends over to hang out for a little while. They got there around 7 to 8 and stayed until around 11 p.m. before heading home. We finished the trip, had a great time, and went home, thinking that everything was good. A few days after we got home, I got an email from a woman in the rental company who claimed that their maintenance guy saw that we had people stay over and we were now being charged an extra $200 for breaking occupancy rules. Next came a back and forth between her and I where I told them no one stayed overnight and that they had left around 10.30 to 11 p.m. But she claimed to me that occupancy is anyone being in the cabin at all, which made no sense. I looked up the legal definition of occupancy, which did not side with her, but she told me it didn't matter and that they would charge me the extra $200. Cue the revenge. Between my girlfriend and I, we got about eight people with 20 different Google accounts, all leaving one-star reviews on the company's Google page. This took the rating that they had of around 4.4 all the way down to mid three stars. It was a local company. Well, someone higher up must have gotten wind of this and they knew exactly who did it. Within a couple hours, I got several emails from the original woman and her supervisor apologizing for their misunderstanding and asking how they could get us to take down the bad reviews. After telling them it was clearly not a misunderstanding, I told them to buzz off since they wanted to treat us that way. And long story shorter than it could be, we ended up getting an offer of $200 off our next visit if we took the reviews down, and they obviously refunded me that extra $200 plus another $100 off that stay. Karen, I hope you understand what occupancy means now if you still have a job. My husband is cheating on me with my best friend. I'm honestly not sure where to start, so I guess I'll just start here. My husband and I have been dating since I was 19 and he was 22. We've been married for 6 years now. We have two kids and I'm six months pregnant with our third. Two years ago, I found out my dad has stage three colon cancer. My dad is my only parent as my mom passed when I was 12. He's my favorite human and life without him doesn't seem colorful. His laugh is contagious and he gives these big bear hugs that seem to make all of your broken pieces feel like they're perfectly in place again. Whenever I've had a hard day, he doesn't poke and prod and he just lets me vent and listens. About five months ago, we discovered that the treatments aren't working for him, and in direct quote of the doctor, he said, months, not years. Since then, he's gotten progressively worse, and now is losing memory. He looked at the dog he got for me on my 21st birthday and said, 
Wow, that's a nice dog. Where'd you get it? My husband has been my absolute rock. He has been there for me, holding my hand and helping me through all of this. He's been so loving and attentive to both me and the kids. Don't get me wrong, I am a mother first, always. I don't allow myself to wallow. My kids are still loved, cared for, and played with, and I haven't let my load slack around the house. Once my dad got his updated prognosis, my husband encouraged me to quit my job. About a month later, we discovered we were pregnant again, and I still hadn't let go of my job. I kept holding out for some reason. After finding out I was pregnant again, he ensured me it was still okay to quit my job, that honestly it would save us a small fortune on daycare costs anyways. So I did. I quit my job. My best friend and I have been friends since diapers. Her family is like my family and vice versa. My mom and her mom grew up together. We've always been solid, and right after my dad's appointment, when we found out he had so little time left, I drove straight to her house, and she held me while I cried for hours. If they are our soulmates in friend form, she was mine. Thick as thieves is what my mom used to say. This morning, as I was up with my three-year-old, he's sick, my husband's work alarm was going off. He has a few he sets, so I turned that one off and gently woke him up. He said he was up late working, so he took the morning off. Rolled over and he went back to sleep. As I went to turn off the remaining of his alarms, I saw a text from my friend on his lock screen that said, I'm assuming since there hasn't been any angry pregnant lady on my doorstep, you haven't told her about us yet. Time froze in that moment. I took his phone and walked away and just read their conversations. Four months, this man has been hooking up with my best friend. Four months, these people have been lying to my face. And I know what you're going to say. You should have seen the warning signs. But I've been clutching this phone in my hand for two hours and nothing. He's been so loving and attentive to me, but he always has been. So kind and gentle. There's been no late nights or work nights except for once in a blue moon. There have been no lingering touches between them or even glances. They act as they have since the day I first introduced them. How sick is it that she calls him her brother, but they're doing this? I know so many people get a moment of clarity in situations like this, but I have none. Aside from being sad about my dad, I haven't changed. I'm still a loving wife and mother. I still doted on him and the kids. I talk to him about how he's doing and how is his day every day. I haven't allowed the ground to swallow me whole. I know what I have to do now, but I just don't want to. I'm about to lose my family and my support system in one blow. I'll confront him tomorrow. Today? Today I just need this last 24 hours of peace. As for her, I won't give her the satisfaction of a response. I don't care why she did it. She did it and it's done. I was always the friend who cleaned up her messes. After today, I'll cut her out of my life like she never mattered at all. This has to be the hardest storm I'll ever weather, but darn it, I know I'll sail through it. If not for me, for my kids. Update. I spent the morning gathering everything I could and making a checklist. I sat in my office for the better part of the morning, telling my husband that I was preparing things for my dad. Not a total lie, I did have to get him sorted with hospice today. My boss would be happy to have me back. However, my lawyer said pump the brakes on that idea for the time being. However, my old boss did tell me that whenever I'm ready, the door is open and to just give her a call. He does not have access to my inheritance from my father nor my mother. My lawyer ensured me of that. I didn't mention her in the post, but my mother-in-law is an absolute angel. I love and adore her so much and she's always been a shoulder to lean on. After he had gone to work for the afternoon, I asked my now ex-best friend's mom and my mother-in-law to meet me at my dad's house. My kids were outside playing with my now ex-best friend's older daughter. I just handed them the screenshots, saving them from the unsavory pictures and the tape that was on there, though I did tell them that they existed too. To say they were furious was an understatement, and they're on my side completely. Angie, my now ex-best friend's mom, is ready to cut contact with her daughter completely. She kept repeating how sorry she was. We hugged and cried together. My mother-in-law told me she couldn't believe she raised a spineless, terrible human. That no matter what happens, I will always have her, and as far as she's concerned, she doesn't have a son, only a daughter. After an in-person meeting with my lawyer, we went over finances, logistics, and everything you could think of. She has all of the proof, and she's out for blood. I know a lot of people were hoping for me to get revenge or do psychological warfare, but honestly, after my kids went to bed, I just took a shower and just broke down. I don't have the strength or energy to dish anything out. I just want out. Pretending like everything was okay today was too exhausting, and I just don't want to do it anymore. 
Am I the jerk for telling my dad I have no interest in meeting his new family? I, 17 female, haven't had a relationship with my dad since I was 8 years old. It broke me when my dad left because it wasn't just him. I lost my aunts and uncles, cousins, grandparents. They all just stopped talking to me. I've been in therapy since I was 11. I've worked out a lot of my issues about my dad. My mother remarried when I was 7. I have a stepdad and two brothers I love very much. I'm applying to colleges and I feel happier than I ever have. Three weeks ago, I got a call from my dad. He told me he was engaged. He was getting married in the fall. He wanted me to come to a reunion so they can get to know each other's family. And I can get to know my new siblings. He said she wanted to meet his kids before they got married. My father has three kids, me, my brother, and sister. I have a relationship with my sister, but we're not close because she lives far away. I hung up. I couldn't deal with it. I was emotional, and I bawled my eyes out. The next day, I called my dad. I told him I had no interest in meeting his new family, that he was cruel for abandoning me, even more cruel for reaching out because he was forced to do so. I already had a family I was happy and secure with, and I had no interest in him being in my life because he was no longer my dad and to not contact me. I called my sister to ask if he reached out to her, and he did, and she was going to go. I told her the conversation. She said what I said was appropriate because it was true, but I could have been nicer about it. I was a bit sad, but my family was there to comfort me. My sister sent me a link to a Facebook post that my new stepmother had shared, saying she couldn't believe that a perfect man could have such terrible kids. My sister told me she was not going to the reunion because she agreed she didn't want to meet this woman after what she said about us. I thought that would be the end of it, and even though that post did upset me, I tried to just let it go. But I started getting calls from my father's side of the family, even my brother, telling me that I was a jerk for ruining the reunion by telling my dad he wasn't my dad. They told me they had canceled the whole thing and he was questioning whether he should get married at all. They told me I could have reached out. It wasn't fair that they were being the ones blamed for the falling out. I have since blocked them. I did see a post on Facebook saying my dad postponed his wedding, but now I can't stop thinking about what they said. I mean, yes, I could have reached out, but I feel that's not fair because I was eight. I shouldn't have to be the one that makes amends. I know that I was harsh and I could have gone about telling him I didn't want him in my life in a nicer way, but I don't think I did anything wrong. Maybe that's because everyone around me is taking my side. I've had multiple people tell me I'm a jerk. I feel guilty and I want an outsider's perspective. Am I the jerk? Edit. I just want to add some stuff. My sister is 23, my brother is 28. My mother had nothing to do with my family cutting me out. Two years ago, I called my dad under the advice of my therapist. When he answered, I started crying and he didn't say anything. He just hung up on me. I think that's when I really moved on from my dad. I am currently still in therapy. I don't plan on leaving anytime soon and I know that I need it and it benefits me in more ways than one. I am my mother's only biological kid. She has said that I should cut ties with my brother. I have also been talking to my sister quite a bit today about what to do about our brother. We only share DNA from our dad, the same as I do with my sister. She says that I need to cut ties with him completely as well, but at the same time I do feel bad because he went through the same abandonment that I did. It's just my dad actually came back to him, whereas he didn't come back to me or my sister. As of right now, I haven't cut ties, not officially anyway, with my brother, but it does seem like that's where it's headed. What on earth did he tell his family when he stopped talking to you? I don't know what he told his family or his fiance. But when I started building a relationship with my sister, he did tell my sister's mother that my mother had filed a restraining order against him, and that was the reason that he couldn't be around me, which was 100% not true. I can assure you, there was never a restraining order filed. My sister's mother figured that out, and when she talked to my father about it, he admitted that he lied. My dad was such a jealous freak, like to the point where he would be mad when she went to work. There was this guy that my mother worked with, and he was super jealous of him, and one day, he finally just accused her of cheating, and she said she didn't cheat, and he didn't believe her, and he left. And then he came home the next day, and he admitted to cheating with another woman, and then they got divorced. About two years later, my mom started a new job, and she ended up dating her boss, and they got married when I was seven, and now he's my stepdad. But I also only hear my parents' side of the story. I've never heard my dad's side of the story. He's never really thought it was important enough to tell me his side of the story, but that's what I know of the whole situation. I really don't know the true story because I was two when everything happened and me and my dad were never really close. He never told me like important things about his life. We didn't talk much when I was with my dad. 
I mostly spent the time with his boyfriend. About my dad's messed up marriages. Me and my siblings all have different mothers. My father has been married four times. If he does marry this woman, this will be his fifth marriage. I didn't even know of my sister's existence until I was nine years old. My sister's mother reached out to my mother when she noticed that her daughter's child support had gone down because my father wasn't meeting his mandatory visitation rights and had to pay more child support towards me. The court told my sister's mother that he had two other kids and she reached out to my mother. We had dinner together. She also reached out to my brother's mother, but they had no interest in knowing my sister. I don't know if my father has any other kids. As far as I'm aware, he doesn't. But he lied to me and my brother about my sister and he lied to my mother about the existence of my brother before she had me. So honestly, who knows? But I do know that his fiance has kids between the ages of 3 and 19. What the heck did he say to you on the phone? The way I remember the conversation going was him saying, Hello, this is so and so. I just wanted to let you know that I'm having this family reunion because recently I got engaged and I'm going to be getting married in the fall and I was hoping that you would be interested in coming to the reunion. Your brother's going to be there as well as the rest of the family and you can meet my fiance and your new step-siblings. That's not exactly word for word, but that's the gist of the conversation. And no, he did not apologize. When I called him back the next day, he actually sounded quite mad that I hung up on him in the first place and he said relatively the same thing just in a harsh tone with fewer words. And that's when I told him that I didn't want to meet his family. He called me about 40 times after I hung up over the course of the next two days. Update. I've talked to my dad and his fiance. I told her everything about everything. Their wedding was off for 11 days, but now it's back on. She didn't really say much to me about it. She mostly just brushed past it. They want to come out here, where I live, and have dinner with me and my mom. My sister has also agreed to come to the dinner, but now he's talking about coming to stay with him for a little while, and I just don't want to do that. I'm a little nervous about the whole thing now, and I just don't want to start another dance with my father that ends badly for me. I don't plan on going to the wedding or any other events that include my dad after the dinner. The only reason that I agreed to go to the dinner was because my sister asked me, not because he asked me. I don't have any interest in having a relationship with my dad, but I do think that it would be healthy if I didn't have any hatred for him. I don't want to be in this limbo where I just feel crappy for the rest of my life because of hatred towards him and I felt like this was an easier way to just deal with it and move on and let it go. Final update. I had dinner with my father and his new fiance as well as her kids on the 18th of May. I feel like I got a lot of childhood feelings off of myself. I explained to my father, his fiance and her family why I felt the way that I felt as well as my reasoning for not wanting to come. I told him that I had no intentions of being in his life over the necessary amount. My dad did ask me quite a couple times if I was going to be able to go up to the wedding. I did agree to go, but I made it clear that I don't want to be involved as an official member in his life, more so someone he might see around the holidays, birthdays, or special events. But other than that, I have no intentions of seeing or interacting with him. He seemed fine with that, and it was a perfect solution for me. I've been told by many of you, as well as people in my personal life, that I should just cut him out of my life and move on. I just feel that having unresolved feelings is unhealthy. Not having answers to things you could have answers seems kind of ridiculous if you have the option to get the answers you want. My relationship with my father is never going to be great. It's never going to be perfect. It's probably never going to be anything other than okay because I don't really think I can see him as anything other than a deadbeat dad. But I'm going to try my best to be civil because I don't want to have any more unresolved feelings with anybody else. I know that it's been over a month since my last update, but during that time I finished my senior year with four B's and four A's. I turned 18 on the 21st of May. I graduated high school and started a new job. It's been a pretty busy month, and so honestly I wasn't even nervous about talking to my father because I felt like it was just another busy thing I had to do. But I'm glad it's over and I'm done with it, and I can now move on with my life. I received an anonymous text message stating that my fiancé is cheating on me. I, 42 female, have been with my fiancé, Caleb, 46, for over two years. We're supposed to be getting married in August. Up until this morning, I thought we had a great relationship. No major fights, spend almost all of our time together, etc. Our boom chicka wow wow life is okay. I could use a bit more, but I'm not complaining. And I've always told him that I was game anytime he wanted to. I have not noticed anything to make me question him. I have had issues with trust in the past, but I have not had any suspicions that anything was going on with him. I received six missed calls at about 3.30 in the morning from two numbers I don't recognize. 
I answered one, and no one spoke on the other line, so I hung up. The second number then called back twice, which I ignored and went back to sleep. I woke up this morning to two text messages from the second number saying, going to copy and paste, Hey, this is Caleb's girlfriend, name spelled incorrectly, and I've been seeing Caleb for a few weeks now and thought you should know, name spelled right. I just replied, and who are you, to the text. I'm really numb and have no idea how to proceed. Do I forward the screenshots to him and ask what's up? Do I wait till I get home from work and ask for his phone? I'm so lost and confused. I had no suspicions whatsoever. Any advice would be welcome. I would wait a little bit to see if they write you back. Try to get information from this person about who they are, details they have that they can provide to you. Take your time and be methodical rather than rushing to tell him first. The whole thing seems a bit off and that they spelled his name wrong and were calling in the middle of the night are points in favor of it being some sort of scam or hoax. Don't immediately jump to conclusions that he's cheating on you. Don't rule it out if you get solid evidence. Update. I didn't say anything to Caleb until I got home. I think I had a suspicion that the texts were not legit, but I needed outside perception. I walked in the door and told him that we needed to talk and showed him the texts. He legitimately looked confused. Then I showed him my call log. He was blown away, then immediately offered me his phone. I looked through it and found nothing. No hidden apps, nothing in the trash or call logs, nothing in his gallery, nothing in his social media. I had texted the person earlier that day at 8, asking if they had any proof by way of screenshots, dates they were together on, or photos. I wasn't salty in the message at all, and I stated that we were supposed to get married in August. When I didn't hear back for about 8 hours, I sent another text saying I was calling BS and that I didn't know what their endgame was, but I wasn't going to fall for it. About 1945 they got back to me. I had no idea you guys were engaged. He said you lived 2 hours away. Tell him to lose my number. I responded with, can you send me some screenshots? When did you see him last? Do you have any pics together? He's denying everything. I'd appreciate it. About 5 minutes later they came back with, Honestly, I have no interest in breaking up a marriage and I should have minded my own business. We hooked up a few times and it really wasn't a big deal. I apologize for any issues I've caused. That really got to me. So my response was, you helped, but it was his choice. I would appreciate having proof. Then I sent one right after this one saying, and you should tell him yourself. After about 20 minutes, I texted that this was BS again. They responded almost right away and sent this final message. I'm at work. Can you stop? Stay with Caleb. Don't. Do whatever. I wanted to make you aware of something that involved you. I thought I'd be doing you a favor, but you continuously accusing me of making up stuff and texting me four times after I don't respond for more than 10 minutes is making me think you should just keep him. Unless you've done over someone. I'm not sure why you'd assume someone is doing over you. Also, I don't see what I would benefit from this, considering he's engaged and lied to me about it and I blocked his number already. Have a good one. The tone in this one changes, and something said in a previous message changes my suspicions. I'm originally from a town about two hours from where I live now, but I lived here for almost four years. Caleb doesn't tell people where I'm originally from. The city and metro area I live in has about 1.5 million people, and it is never asked. I was in a horrible relationship up until about nine months before I moved here, and when we split, he displayed very stalkerish behaviors. The ex even went so far as to use a number spoofing service to contact me after I blocked him. Caleb gave up his phone easily and without hesitation. His non-verbals showed genuine confusion regarding the whole situation. The conclusion that I drew was that this is somehow someone from my past trying to either destroy my relationship or test how strong it is. I'm thinking that whoever it is discovered that I'm in a relationship somehow and wanted to shake it up to see what would fall out. We are still together and are still getting married. My girlfriend is acting weird and hiding things from me. My girlfriend, 24 female, and I, 26 male, have been living together for a few months now. After the first lockdown, we decided that we didn't want to spend so much time apart anymore, especially with another lockdown on its way. We've been together for almost four years now. Everything is going smoothly and we're best friends. Living together has been a real pleasure. However, there are some peculiar things happening. Occasionally, my girlfriend acts suspiciously. A few days ago, I noticed her looking guilty, and when she went from the kitchen to our room, she was hiding something behind her back. I playfully asked her what it was, and she said nothing. I laughed and asked again, 
but she got angry and locked herself in our room. It turned out that she was holding a fork. A simple fork, nothing more. This has happened twice this month. The first time, I accidentally bumped into her and she was hiding two spoons. She ran to our room again. When I asked her about it later, she said it was none of my business and that everyone has their secrets. I accepted her response, but I couldn't help but wonder why she was hiding spoons and forks. I've also noticed her taking the cutlery back from our room to the kitchen on occasion, but I never see them in the room. Update. After posting, I became worried. What was she doing behind my back? Did she have some sort of a disorder? Should I press for more answers? Should I install a camera? Should I surprise her by entering the room when she's alone? I decided to sit her down and talk about it. We usually communicate well and rarely argue during such discussions. However, this time, even though I was the sweetest I had ever been, she became really angry. Stop asking about it. No means no and you won't get an answer. After that, she grew cold and didn't talk to me for days. The comments on Reddit scared me, especially about her doing something that could hurt her. So I decided to install a camera in our room. When I reviewed the footage, it confused me even more. I saw her putting the cutlery in a plastic bag, then placing it in her backpack, which she then stored in our dresser. After discovering this, I looked for the backpack and found it, containing the cutlery, a pan, and a plate. I was even more puzzled. I had more questions than answers at that point. So I set her down again. I took the backpack, opened it up in front of her, and asked her once more. She became really angry, then started crying, and then abruptly left for a walk. Two hours later, she sent me a message saying she was at her sister's and would come back when she felt ready. She returned two days later because she had to work and had no other choice. Then it was her turn to sit me down and finally explain everything. She was fidgeting, nearly crying, but also laughing. She said, I know it's stupid, but I just hate washing dishes. Confused, I asked her what she meant. She apologized for her previous behavior and she said she was embarrassed to tell me the truth. I hate washing dishes, so when it's my turn, I hide some of them. Then when it's your turn, I put them back, so I have fewer dishes to wash. It suddenly made sense. Our rule was that the person who cooks doesn't have to do the dishes. I always thought that since she cooks fancy meals, I ended up washing so many dishes. At that point, I burst out laughing because it was such a ridiculous situation. It was also incredibly funny in some way. I confessed about the camera and she was initially offended but then laughed it off, admitting that she would probably have done the same. I showed her the original post and she apologized for causing me unnecessary worry. All's well that ends well. It's actually a funny story with no hard feelings. She's still embarrassed about it as expected. From now on, I will always wash the dishes and she will take care of the laundry. Edit. I feel the need to clarify because some people are overreacting. I won't break up with her over this. It's not as bad as you might think. It's just a childish thing. I caught her hiding once and she thought it was too late to go back, so she continued until I found out. She got angry because she was embarrassed. She has anxiety and some things are difficult for her. It happens. It's only a small part of who she really is. I'm not wearing rose-colored glasses. I'm a very down-to-earth person and I see things as they are. Yes, it resulted in me doing more dishes, but what's one more plate or spoon? Also, we used to alternate. One day was my turn and the next was hers. She never kept the dishes hidden for long and they were always in a plastic bag inside the backpack, like someone would take their lunch to work. She's a human, not just a post on Reddit. Am I the jerk for telling my dad his girlfriend didn't buy me a Starbucks drink? I, 17 female, have been living with my dad, who's 45, his girlfriend of two years, who's 33, and her daughter, who's 13, for a couple of months now, while my mom, who's 40, is visiting my sick grandfather in Sweden. I've only ever stayed at my dad's on weekends, so it's been hard getting used to living with his girlfriend and her kid full time. The kid is super whiny and pretty spoiled because girlfriend dotes on her, so I usually just stay in my room. Today, girlfriend was taking her daughter on a special outing because she passed a math test, and my dad suggested that I go with them for a girl's day out. I wanted to say no, but I knew that he wanted me to get to know his girlfriend and his girlfriend's daughter better, so I agreed. He gave his girlfriend $300 to spend during the outing. We spent the day going in and out of stores girlfriend's daughter liked in the mall complex. Girlfriend ended up buying her a ton of clothes, makeup, and other stuff that I don't remember. On our way back home, girlfriend stopped at the Starbucks because daughter wanted a drink and some cake pops. She ordered a drink for her and her daughter and two cake pops. I asked her if I could get something too, and she said she ran out of money and she'd get me something next time. 
When they got their order, I asked if I could have one of the cake pops, and girlfriend said that it was her daughter's treat for hard work, and it would be wrong for me to take one since I didn't do anything that deserved being rewarded. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty upset. When we got back home, my dad saw their drinks and asked where mine was. I told him that I wasn't allowed to get one because I don't deserve it. His girlfriend got upset and said I was twisting her words, and the daughter just said I was being greedy and was jealous of her. I know I'm not entitled to a drink or a cake pop, but I also don't think it's wrong to be a little annoyed. Am I the jerk? Oh, sweetie, not the jerk. And I want you to know that you absolutely were entitled to a drink and a cake pop or another treat of your choosing. Your dad gave her $300 that was meant to be spent on all three of you for the day out. Sure, her daughter may have earned something special for her hard work at school, but from the sound of it, he intended for all of you to get treated a bit, and it's disgusting that she would go to a coffee shop and get things for herself and her daughter, but not for you. As someone older than your dad, even, I can tell you that his girlfriend's behavior was super not okay, and not the way she should be treating her partner's kid. None of my friends would ever treat their stepkids or partner's kids that way in a million years. I'm so sorry that happened to you, and I'm really glad you told your dad. She deserves to get yelled at. OP. Thank you. You've really made me feel better. You are nowhere near in the wrong for being annoyed about the way they treated you, and the two of them should be ashamed of themselves for manipulating the situation, and by extension your father. Once they got called out for their nasty behavior, the $300 was for all three of you. The least they could have done was give you $3 for a cake pop. The fact that they didn't even want to do that should be a clear indication to your father that they cannot be trusted around you. You are definitely not the jerk his girlfriend was. But spill the tea, what was your dad's reaction to girlfriend's lame excuse? OP, this happened 30 minutes ago and before he said anything, I just went up to my room. I'm hearing yelling from downstairs though. I love my dad a lot and he's always looked out for me, so I don't think he wouldn't believe me. Update, I just finished talking to my dad. I explained everything that happened at the mall and he apologized and said he'll be returning everything that was bought and will be taking a day off work tomorrow so we could do something together. He also put up girlfriend and daughter in a hotel so I can have space from them and said they'll be staying there until my mom gets back. Once I'm ready to see them, he said they will apologize to me and once my mom comes back, he's going to have a talk with his girlfriend. We made $200,000 a year, but my husband is still getting food from the food bank. I've been in a committed relationship with my husband for 17 years and overall things have been great. We've had a few rough patches, but what's important to note is that while he earns more than me and is considered the main provider, I have a substantial trust fund that ensures we're financially stable. I work part-time as a teacher while attending university, earning less than him, and most of my income goes towards tuition. Our household income exceeds $200,000 annually, while the average in our area is below $50,000. The ongoing issue we have is my husband's frugality. He likes to control my spending and have the final say on how he uses his earnings. It's worth mentioning that I've never used any of his income and I have no intention to do so. However, the main point of contention between us is his frequent visits to the food banks. Despite having more than enough food at home, he insists on going to food banks to save money. He intentionally looks disheveled and uses our beat up car to blend in, even though he's never experienced food scarcity. I've explained to him the need for food donations in our community, even showing him social media posts from local food banks, but he remains indifferent. I suggested he volunteer or donate to gain first-hand experience, but he refuses. The unfortunate part is that since we're never short on food, most of what he brings home ends up getting thrown away. Today, I discovered our fridge filled with fresh produce and meat that clearly didn't come from our regular grocery store. When I confronted him about it, he admitted to going to the food bank after seeing a Facebook post about a donation of fresh food. People on social media were already asking if there was any left, and there wasn't. I showed him these comments, but he just brushed it off, claiming people should have gone earlier. Exhausted by the situation, I packed a bag and I went to stay with my brother for the weekend, asking for space to think things over. My husband is accusing me of overreacting, being vindictive, and threatening to go back to the food bank regardless of my feelings. His family is also messaging me, calling me a jerk, and urging me to stop interfering with his choices. I turned off my phone, but now they're bombarding my brother with messages too. Thankfully, he supports my decision and he ignores them. All I want is to enjoy the rest of my week without being angry at my husband. Yes, I could let this go and not scold him, but the food he takes could have gone to people who truly need it. I'm not leaving my husband, 
but I need a few days away to gain some clarity. Am I wrong for wanting this space? Not the jerk. Your husband is stealing from people that are less fortunate. I'm frugal too, and I love to save money wherever I can. I use coupons, buy store brand versus name brand for some products, etc. What your husband's doing isn't frugality, it's being a bad person. I would go to the food bank with his photo and speak to the person in charge. Tell them you're very sorry your husband has been coming in, but you want to let them know that he's not in need of a food bank. If possible, I'd offer to make a charitable donation to cover the food he's stolen from them. I don't know if they can outright refuse him or not, but it's worth a shot. They should be aware. I'm seriously concerned that his response to you trying to reason with him is to say he's going to go to more food banks. What a vindictive and gross response, considering you've thrown food away due to him having too much. My response would be, fine, you're doing this to save money. For every food bank you visit, I'll go to the grocery store and spend no less than 500 on groceries, which I will immediately donate to food banks. Since you don't care about my opinion on your saving habits, you will have no say on how I spend either. Found out my husband has a second family, and I'm absolutely broken. My husband, my rock, has been having an affair for over 17 years. We've been married for over 25 years. We have three kids, two are in college and one who still lives at home, but turns out he's had another set this whole time. My husband is an insurance broker. He has multiple branches over the country, which he spends week on, week off. Turns out, on his week off, he's been with his other family in Albuquerque, where his other branch is. He's got a fiancé, whom he has two kids with, both in their early teens. I found out when I went to make a new Facebook account, and when I searched my husband's first name, another profile with another last name pops up, and through that profile were the links to his fiancé's and his other kids' Facebooks. My husband is currently with said family, and I know it's him because his most recent post is a photo of him and that other family eating dinner. Among those photos were photos of him kissing her and him being fatherly with the kids who look nearly identical to my husband. I'm absolutely broken. Almost every part of me wants to scream in his face and reprimand him for ruining my life. But another part of me wants to pretend to be ignorant and let it be. Because our life is peaceful. He's good with our kids. He's the main source of financial income. He's loving but he's also all those things to another family. Not only would I be tearing a gaping hole into my family, I'd be opening up a vortex for them too. My heart is in shambles. I've never cried so much in my life. My youngest son is currently on a graduation trip with his friends, and I'm alone till my lying, cheating, jerk husband comes home. My life is absolutely wrecked. It's literally a movie plot. I'm hoping he'll just come home and it'll be a big misunderstanding why he's kissing a woman with a ring on her finger. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm tempted to just pack a bag and leave. I can't be in the home where we've raised our kids, where we've spent every Christmas for the last 26 years, and where I've been alone on New Year's taking care of our babies, while he works his butt off. I just can't. I want to leave a note for him to come home to, hurt him like he's hurt me, but I don't think that's possible. I don't know how I'll ever face him again. Update, four days later. This is a follow-up. I'm not in any means good with legal things, so all legal advice has been noted. I've rung an attorney, we're discussing the process. He's also told me to gather as much evidence as I can, such as photos of the Facebook pages, text messages, and recent flight information. All have been put into a folder and I'll present it to a judge or jury when we go into some sort of divorce proceeding. Again, not fully clear with specifics, but it's a good sign. I've also been in contact with the other woman. I've told her, explained the situation, and she was equally as distraught. From what I'm aware, she's financially independent from him and they don't share property, so it seems very clean cut on her behalf. My husband is aware of the fact I know and is currently staying in a hotel, but he is unaware the other woman knows. I confronted him when he walked through the door. He started to cry and plead, and it was honestly kind of pathetic. I mean, I was crying too, but I've chosen to think of him as a pathetic coward for doing this, because he is. But anyways, I have my name on the property. We both do, so it's not like I can just kick him out, but he's chosen to stay away for my sake. All I'm thinking is, if he chose to stay away for my sake, maybe being faithful for my sake should have been considered too. Despite this, he's staying away. He's in a hotel downtown where he calls every few hours to check up. I'm no longer sad. Well, I am, but I'm way more furious than sad currently. My kids still have no idea and my youngest thinks my husband is just working more in Albuquerque because of a business problem. I'm still confused at how to tell them that they have two half-siblings and two parents, one with an extra backup parent. 
I'm just feeling very, very unappreciated and unwanted lately. Maybe your kind words have been so helpful. Thank you so much. Much love. Update, six months later. I won't be going into details about the divorce because it's still ongoing, but do rest assured it is happening. A few people seemed worried I was going to stay with him, and for a period of time, I would have. But no, we're divorcing. On that note, I've completely cut contact with him. Our contact is through lawyers only. He officially moved out of the house, and my middle moved back in to help out over the break. My kids have, to my knowledge, cut most contact with him, but I haven't asked as it's not my place. Also, custody isn't a problem because my youngest turned 18 recently. We've also been in contact with the other family and we even spent Christmas together. Despite being a little awkward at first, me and his ex fiance are trying our hardest to bring the kids together harmoniously. And that'll be the last update. I'm logging off of Reddit now. I will continue living my life. I'll try to support my kids through theirs, but I'll forever be thankful for the support and love that you all have shown me. Yours truly and sincerely, OP. I, 32 female, am invited to join a get-together with three other women and I don't know how to behave or act. So I, 32 female, got invited to a get-together with three other women, their spouses and their kids, which sounds lovely, but it's kind of my personal nightmare fuel right now. Three years ago, I moved into a very, very rural area for my soon-to-be ex-husband. Shortly after moving, my car broke down and I didn't have the money for a new one. Since then, I practically stayed home all day. The only time I'm out of the house is to bring my son to kindergarten, bring him home, or when I need some groceries that I can buy in the very small shop here in the village. My social interactions were limited to some info exchange with the teachers, sometimes another parent who wanted small talk or the lady at the bakery who likes to gossip. Making friends was hard, as everyone here seems to always be so busy. Six months ago, I met this woman who we will call Jane. I don't talk to her on a daily basis and we haven't exchanged numbers. She works at this small shop. Every time I buy something there, we would chat for a bit. And last week, Jane invited me and my son to just have a fun day with her, two of her friends, their spouses, and the kids. I accepted. This get-together is next week, and I'm constantly going from excitement to panic to pure joy to mental exhaustion. I've been kept locked up by my soon-to-be ex for three years. I have no clue how someone behaves around others. What are topics to talk about? What topics do you avoid? Do you still shake hands when you meet someone new? Do I bring gifts? Those and more questions are constantly on my mind. I would love to have some friends and I don't want to ruin it. To be fair, I thought I ruined it already a month ago. She did me a favor and as a thank you, I baked her some cookies. I handed them to her while doing a bow, like someone would bow to a princess, and I said, I couldn't do the favor you did for me, so the least I can do is bake. She smiled, but I wanted to run away as fast as possible. I'm so awkward and just don't know how to be normal anymore. I appreciate every advice, even if it's just a don't pick your nose. I'm desperate. Thanks for reading. You sound genuinely lovely and these people will be lucky to have you in their lives. I find the best topics of conversation in social situations are often the most basic. You just ask people how their week is going and share stuff that's going on with you. It can seem awkward at first, but eventually you'll find things that resonate. Congratulations on leaving your ex. Good luck with the next stage of your life. OP, thank you so much. The basics sound good. I can do that without making awkward gestures. Should I ask her if I should bring something? Baked goods or a salad or whatever? Or would that be rude since I was invited? I don't know if locked up was the right wording. Turns out he had money on the side and could have helped me with a car. He also always had something planned when I wanted to meet with someone. He basically ruined upcoming friendships for me. And he insisted to buy groceries after work so I couldn't even do the big grocery shopping or get a change of scenery. I'm glad he's out of my life. Update. I talked to my therapist about everything and she basically said the same as the commenters. Be you, be quirky. Who wants only boring friends when you could have someone who brings sunshine and fun into your day? So first things first, the get together was canceled. One of the women broke her leg and everyone agreed to schedule it after she's fine again. The day after my post, I asked Jane if I could have her number. Still awkward. I told her I won't call her right too much and I would contact her for the get-together only. She laughed a sweet laugh and told me to contact her whenever I feel like talking about whatever I want. She would be happy because she considers me a friend. In my head, I was shrieking like a fangirl. As we talked and texted for some days, she asked me if I could give a friend of hers my number. This friend is the other friend from the group, not the one with a broken leg. Shortly after agreeing, an unknown number texted me and introduced herself as Hannah. 
She didn't beat around the bush and asked me if I wanted to come to her wedding. I asked if she was sure about that because a wedding is for family and friends. She wrote, I'm married already, but we didn't have a party. It was in the courthouse. We want to say our vows again and celebrate with loving people around us, family and friends. And well, maybe we could be friends. We texted for a while and she told me how good Jane speaks of me, that Hannah herself is a bit quirky and she would love to have another quirky friend. I accepted the invitation. She told me the wedding will be at her farm and she's looking forward to meeting me and my son there. She was also very understanding of my son's avoidant restrictive food intake disorder and has no problems with me bringing some snacks for my son. I promised to bring more so he could share if the other kids want some. All in all, I'm happy to meet new people soon and maybe make some more friends. And the best part for now is texting with two lovely women whenever they have free time. They're both busy people. I'm glad I posted on Reddit. It kind of gave me a confidence boost and I was able to ask Jane for her number. All I've experienced since then was pure happiness and joy. I'm so proud of you for putting yourself out there. I empathize with you. I've always struggled to know how to behave around other women, especially when I really want to befriend them. You have broken the ice beautifully, and it sounds like Jane and Hannah are kind and welcoming people. I hope you enjoy the wedding and that these new friendships flourish. OP, thank you so much. I still have a lot of work to do regarding myself. I still look at someone think I would like to talk to that person and then beat myself up with thoughts like they have enough friends already or out of my friendship league. Take my virtual hug. I'll cheer you on. You can do it. Am I the jerk for making my wife feel bad about her Father's Day gift for me? My wife, who's 29, and I, 29 male, have a one-year-old son, let's call him James, and he's a handful, but we love him more than anything. Just a little backstory. I used to be kind of trashy, as she would call it, and the sense that I had a mullet and I wore pit vipers all the time. Picture what Theo Vaughn looks like. That's kind of what I was looking like before. Well, I got rid of the mullet and now I just wear the vipers because I think they're cool. Aside from that, we both currently work full-time and I'm also a full-time student. My wife decided to tell me last week she set up a surprise for me for Father's Day and said, I set up a photo shoot for you and James to take pictures together and make it like a trashy photo shoot. I loved this idea because inside, I still feel like I'm that person. She said she wanted to set it up like both of us on a lawnmower, make it look like a hick dad holding his kid, who is also wearing baby vipers. The idea is hilarious to me, and I'm all for it. Well, the person who's doing the photos is my coworker, and my wife is also friends with her. Let's call her Katie. I found out about the photos, and my wife said, talk to Katie and set up a date. I said okay, but I also thought she planned it already. I asked how much they would cost, and she said she wasn't sure, so I had to ask about the price. So I just said okay and found a date that we were free. My wife knows the date planned. We didn't get a time yet at the moment. I asked my wife yesterday when the baby vipers would arrive in the mail because the pictures are next week. She said she never ordered them, so I said, oh, well I guess I'll order them then. And she said, no, it's fine, I'll just order them. Today my wife asked me what time the photo shoot is next week with Katie and I said, I'm not sure, I thought you were planning it out for me. She said she doesn't know my schedule, which is a lie because we both write out schedules on a calendar in the kitchen. I also have a set work schedule three days a week. I work in a hospital, so I work three 12 hour shifts and I go to school every Monday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Saturday I'm off. She knows this as my schedule hasn't changed in a few months. I told her I would figure out a time and she said, no, it's fine, I'll just handle it. I told her, for something you wanted to surprise me with for Father's Day, it really feels like I'm just planning the whole thing. She got mad and said, Wow, I must be the worst wife ever. I'll try and do better from now on since I'm so horrible. Oh, I can't stand people who act like that. She told me I was being a jerk and now she isn't talking to me. I just felt like this was meant to be a surprise for me and I'm literally just planning all of it. And it would have just felt nice to be surprised in some way about it instead of having to essentially plan my own present. Am I the jerk for making my wife upset about my gift? ETA for everyone asking about what I did for Mother's Day. I just copy and pasted my comment below. I planned a date day for us to go to the beach, so we went to the beach for the day as a family. Before the beach, I went out and bought us bagel sandwiches from a breakfast place that she really likes near our house. After the beach, we went out to lunch, and we also went and got banana splits after lunch because she was talking about them the entire week before Mother's Day. I also bought her a giant inflatable screen so she could watch movies on a big screen in the backyard with a projector. I know she's wanted the projector, so that's why I got it. 
and she loves the beach, so that's why I made that the primary site for the day. Not the jerk. Her gift to you was an idea, and now you have to execute every part of it. That's not a gift, it's a burden. Otherwise, the idea sounds cute. Not the jerk. Also, she's trying to make herself the victim by calling herself a horrible wife, so the narrative is switched from you feeling neglected to you basically bullying her. Having an issue with her actions does not equate you calling her a horrible wife. She's intentionally spinning your words. A guy I met at a work event out of town won't stop bothering me. Around 10 months ago, I, 25 female, went on my first work-related trip to a different city. There I met a guy, Jerry, who's 43. I know there's a huge age gap, but I know myself. I'm generally into older guys. I met him at the hotel lobby I was staying. He asked me out for coffee. I said yes. He was really charismatic. I was blushing the entire time. We spent a good weekend together. No hooking up though. We did kiss multiple times. He gave me his number and he didn't want to add me on social media because he said he doesn't use it. He gave me an Instagram ID to contact. This really made me a bit suspicious. I had this gut feeling that something about him wasn't right. So I decided to search and do some background work. I tried to search him on Facebook and other social media, but I hit a wall. I remembered that he gave me a business card. It was a card from his company. I also asked for a friend's help to find something on him. I don't know. I was just adamant of finding some dirt on him. Eventually, we did find some interesting facts. That jerk is married and he has two kids. I saw his kids. One of them is about 16 to 17 and another one is about 10 to 11. I wanted to throw up. I know my own sister had had horrible time after her boyfriend cheated on her. I know the pain, even if it's secondhand. I cut all contact with him. I blocked his number. A few weeks after I totally ghosted him, I saw him at the parking lot of my office. He knew where I worked. Again, my fault because I told him where I worked. He asked me why I didn't return his calls and blocked him on everything. I screamed at him, called him a liar. I told him I knew he was married and that he had kids. And in fact, his oldest son is closer to my brother's age. This is really disgusting. He broke down crying and begging me to not leave him. He kept ranting how unhappy he is in his marriage. He just wanted someone to love him and when he saw me, he fell in love with me and he wants to be with me. I told him this is not possible. He's married. I can't do this to anyone. Even if I don't know her, I have a decency to not ruin someone's marriage and forever be known as a homewrecker. He kept begging. I had to threaten him that I would shout so that people can throw him out. His calling and stalking did not stop. I asked a friend and coworker of mine to escort me to my car because I was so afraid that Jerry would come towards me. He sent me message after message saying he was sorry, that he can be a better man if I'm with him. I had to deactivate my social media for a while. For like five months, it was calm and quiet. I had no issue. Then again, I get a message in my email from Jerry saying that he has divorced his wife for my sake. And since he's not with his wife now, he and I can be together. I was really creeped out by this. I told him over and over, I do not want him. His harassment did not stop. He threatened to ruin my career. He blamed me for ruining his marriage because I made a move on him. That's not true. He was the one who approached me first. I was just a little friendly with him. If I knew he was married back then, I would never have reciprocated his flirting. I feel lost. I keep blaming myself that maybe all of this wouldn't have happened if I just not been friendly with him. I also don't want him to ruin my career, but I'm scared for my life. Edit. I think I should mention I'm not from the USA. The police in my area are corrupt. Jerry is in a very high position in his company. He can easily ruin my career. I'm collecting evidence because of his harassment. Some have asked if he's lying about the divorce and moving away. Actually, I don't know if he is divorced or just separated. He told me he left his wife for me as if it would impress me. And I thought about moving, but it's scary because right here I have my family and friends. If I move to a new place, he might come there as well and I would have no support. About blocking him? He's blocked everywhere. I even changed my number. I also opened a private social media account that no one knows about. I need social media for work too. But still, he finds a way to pop up in my life. Update. I've decided to file a restraining order. But these things take time in my country. But I have my dad and my uncle with me. They're helping me find a new place and probably a new job. As soon as I can serve him with a restraining order, I can be relieved. But I'm afraid if it will work or not because he seems mad. His messages have been reduced because I threatened to call his wife. But the problem was yesterday 
His wife emailed me and said that she wants to meet me. She said in details that she knows that her husband has some connection with me. I've never met this woman in my life. I don't know why she wants to meet me. I'm guessing she wants to talk. But then again, he told me he left his wife. Then how did his wife know my information or even my email? If I meet her, my stalker could know I talked to his wife. I'm really scared for my life. What should I do? A part of me thinks that she might help me with my case. Has anyone ever been in my position? To those of you saying that it's not his wife, that it's him, I know there's a chance it could be him, but the woman seems desperate. She told me she found something about her husband and wanted to warn me. I don't know how much of it is true. Update on the wife. So I took your advice and I did not go to see her. We had a couple of email exchange. I told her clearly under no circumstances do I want to meet someone who I can't trust. Whatever she has to say, she can say it in the email. She understood. I thought she would be opposed to this idea. She told me she's been having doubts about her husband for a long time, so she hired someone to keep an eye on him. There, she found out that he's been having an affair with multiple women. The first time he did this, she forgave him, but this time he has only stuck on me. She said that she found some pictures of me on his laptop. She shared a file which contained some pictures of me coming out of my office, me going to the gym, me going out to eat. I was shaking. I was in a very emotionally vulnerable state after seeing that I cannot be safe in my own life. I feel like I'm being watched even now as I'm typing this. Imagine being a prisoner in your own house. I ended up telling the wife to have a Zoom meet for 5 minutes. I used a disposable account and just for extra safety, I had the Zoom call on a public space along with a friend. I do not trust anyone at this point. I gave her some condition that I will not be showing my face. If she wants to show her face to me, then fine, it's up to her. I saw her for the first time. She looked like the woman I saw in Jerry's picture with his wife and kids. She was basically crying and telling me she had made a huge mistake. She should have left that time and now he's bringing shame to her as well. I didn't say much, just the story of how me and Jerry met. Also, Jerry lied. He didn't leave his wife. He was not separated from her, but I'm sure he will be now. I feel so exposed. I can't believe this is happening to me. I always saw this happen in movies. I'm moving in with my cousin because I don't feel safe anymore. I wish I had never met him. I feel disgusted that I kissed him and I hugged him. I don't think any amount of shower is enough to wash all of that away. Also, I feel guilty that I broke a family too. Thanks for listening to my vent. I don't think I'll update anymore until I get my restraining order. Final update. To be honest, I do not feel safe at all. This guy's been stalking me for God knows how long. I can't even go to my office without any escorts. In a perfect world, I would want to have him locked up for life. Today I messed up by destroying my relationship because of a friend. I, 22 female, had been going out with my ex-boyfriend, 31 male, for about 9 months. About 6 months ago, I started my job, which was my first job since graduating college. I worked at this job during a summer internship and they hired me back after graduating. Since I started the job, I made friends with the same people I was friends with during the internship, including a girl who I'll refer to as Friend 1. She's 26, female. My ex was convinced that friend one had a crush on me, even though she didn't. She shaved her head and has a different sense of style, but she strayed. Her and I went to the same gym and we would often go together with two other coworkers. She's helped me when I was in a very bad place mentally because she has been through similar experiences. About three months into the relationship, he had to leave for a month for work. Because I had recently graduated college, I didn't have a lot of friends because they were either still at college or they lived far away. Friend one and some other coworkers were my only friends during that time. I really got to know all of them and I enjoyed hanging out with them all. My ex didn't like that, especially since we were long distance. After three more months, I canceled my gym membership and stopped hanging out with my coworkers as much and that included friend one. She would still text me occasionally, especially if she was having a bad day. I told my ex that I wasn't hanging out with her outside of work and that I would avoid her more at work. I stopped going to team-sponsored events outside of work to avoid her because he didn't like her. This past Thursday, she was having a really bad day and said some things to make me worry for her mental health and safety. I offered to go on a walk with her for a bit to help calm her down. On Saturday, my ex and I were driving to go camping, a three-hour drive, and he started looking through my messages. This isn't the first time that he's done this. He would go through my phone a lot when I was sleeping to see if I was texting friend one. He did see the message about me asking her if she wanted to go on a walk and he got upset. He told me I lied to him and I'd betrayed him. He said friend one ruined the relationship. We ended up camping anyway and he kept bringing it up throughout the weekend. 
On Monday, we got lunch at a restaurant before driving home and he told me to choose between him and getting rid of her in my life. I told him that I wasn't going to choose. As long as I still work at that job, there's no way of avoiding her. I can't leave the job because I don't have enough work experience to get another one with the same salary. He got mad at me and started yelling at me, telling me again and again that I destroyed the relationship. He also threw a water bottle at my car and it bounced back and got me. It was a very long and awkward ride home. He called me the next day to continue insulting me and telling me how much I ruined the relationship. I broke it off with him after he kept calling me and insulting me throughout the night, knowing I had early meetings in the morning. I ended up going to the hospital on Tuesday because I had a severe panic attack that caused severe chest pain, which made me miss a day of work. He's convinced that I destroyed the relationship even though I already lost my friend, friend one, gave up grad school, a gym membership, and a lot of money on a vacation my ex and I were supposed to go on. I gave up weekends with my family and friends to stay with him where we wouldn't leave his apartment because he didn't want to run into anyone he knew. Edit. I feel like I messed up because he told me I could have stopped the friendship sooner as soon as he told me about being uncomfortable with the friendship. Friend 1 update. She was completely understanding when I told her about the situation. She was proud of me for standing up for myself. I'm lucky to have her, other friends, and my family as a support system. My mom told me she was proud of me today and her and I cried together. Update. X blocked. I'll figure out how to get my stuff later. I need to focus on my health now. Health update. I have to wear a halter monitor for the next two weeks to monitor my heart. I was told stress and anxiety make it worse and was given a prescription for anti-anxiety medication. It was medicine I used to take and I'm going to give it a try now to see how I feel. Vacation update. My mom and I are taking a girls trip together. Not to the same location, my ex's home country, but to go visit my aunt who lives in a beach house. Plus, my best friend, a different friend since high school, invited me to come with her to visit her home country later this year. And most importantly, grad school update. I'm sending the deposit as soon as I get my paycheck on Friday. My job is paying for some of it, so thankfully money won't be something to stress about too much. Thank you again to everyone for opening my eyes and for helping me to start this healing journey. I appreciate you all. Am I the jerk for not letting my daughter-in-law come to my house after how she treated my grandson at Christmas? My son, Daniel, who's 28, has been married to Kathy, who's also 28, for four years now, and they have two kids. I have a younger daughter, Leah, who's 25, who's a single mom to Travis, who's seven. Travis is autistic and has a lot of sensory issues. He receives therapies, but it's still a struggle. Everyone knows about his triggers and what we do to avoid them. While I've tried to be welcoming of Kathy, she's always been a little cold. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt, as we are a very loud, extroverted family and she's introverted. She's never really made an effort to get to know us, despite our numerous attempts. Daniel has told us that her family is a lot different and isn't as warm, so we accept her personality. The only issue is she's very cold to Travis. We're all firm with him and have boundaries, but Kathy finds his triggers ridiculous. Important info, Leah and Travis live with my husband and myself. Every year at Christmas, we have a few close relatives over and host a Yankee swap with gag gifts. Last year, my sister-in-law was showing me her contribution. It was one of those singing Santas. Travis had seen this very one at the drugstore and had a meltdown over it. I said it would be okay, I'd just make sure Travis didn't pick that gift and we'd tell whoever did pick it to please not press play. One person opened it. Travis saw it and instantly got on edge, but the person promised they wouldn't play it and he calmed down. When it was Kathy's turn, she stole it. If you've never done a swap before, the point of the game is you can either pick a new gift or steal someone else's if you like it better. She was sitting next to Travis at the time and pressed play. He had a meltdown and had to be brought out of the room. Kathy was laughing. I took her out of the room and asked her why the heck she did that. She said it was just a joke and she thought we were exaggerating. She then accused us of purposefully making Travis scared of things. We have no reason for doing this. Trust me, for his mental health, we wish these things didn't trigger him, but they do. I asked why it was so hard for her to just accommodate her nephew. That's when she said that Travis soaks up all of the attention and it's not fair that Leah had a kid before them. She and Daniel then promptly left. While Daniel has apologized on the behalf of Kathy, she has refused to do so. We've tried to hold family meetings, but she won't show up. Leah has seen Daniel and his kids since, but won't see Kathy. After a few months of back and forth with Kathy making it clear she wouldn't apologize, my husband and I decided Kathy is not welcome in our home until she does, 
and is ready to treat Travis right. We'll still see them, but not in our home. Kathy and Daniel have found this unfair. They refuse to meet up for Mother's Day and they won't come to the Father's Day brunch, which is their choice, but they've made it clear they only made it because we have excluded Kathy from events in our home. Am I the jerk? I hooked up with my neighbor. Now he won't stop stalking me. So I made a huge mistake recently that I really regret. I, 22 female, ended up hooking up with my neighbor who's 30 male. We live in the same building and I came home from a night out about two weeks ago and I met him in the hallway. We got talking and he invited me back to his place. We had a drink, one thing led to another and it just happened. I have to admit, it was pretty awkward and bad. I'm cringing as I write this, but as we were doing this, he told me that he loved me. We had spoken about twice before this night. So I got my first impression, maybe he was a bit strange. I was really embarrassed by the whole thing, thought he would be too, and not very maturely decided to just avoid him. I thought he would get the hint that it was just a drunk one-time thing and I wasn't interested, but I kept seeing him all the time. I think he must have worked out what time I leave and get back from work because I started bumping into him way more than I used to. I kept the conversation short and acted uninterested because I thought he would get the hint and back off a little. I guess I was just avoiding that awkward conversation, telling him I wasn't interested, but in no way was I encouraging him. He persisted, and then a few days ago he added me on Facebook, which I ignored. The next time I saw him, he asked me why I hadn't accepted his friend request. So I decided to be a bit more assertive and said something like, The other night was fun, but I'm really not interested in anything. He was quite upbeat and replied, Okay, that's cool but can we still be friends? So I thought maybe I had been a bit immature towards him and now that I've told him my intentions, we could be friends. I still think he's being a bit overly friendly with me. I'm sure he's waiting to bump into me again because I see him like all the time. He also is not shy about asking personal questions like about ex-boyfriends and stuff. I get that some people are more open about some things, but I find it a little weird. On Facebook, he has liked so many of my pictures I know we all stalk people on Facebook, but he's very obvious about it. He has also messaged a couple of times asking me to hang out. My question is, is his behavior a bit weird or am I just being overdramatic? I'm happy to be his friend, but I feel like he's being a bit over the top. I don't want to act like a jerk towards him, but I don't know how to really tell him to tone it down without coming across as one. He's someone I will probably keep seeing, so I feel I have to be nice to him, but he's really weirding me out. Dude. You should not have brushed off his I love you comment. I only brushed it off because I thought it was a silly drunk comment and I didn't want to make the whole thing even more awkward by mentioning it. Maybe I have been oblivious, but I just didn't think anyone would say that when they were hooking up with someone they didn't really know. Hindsight is a great thing, but I've deleted him on Facebook for now and I hope it will all just subside. I've told a couple of friends about it anyways, so if things get worse, they know. But honestly, I don't think he's that crazy. You really do not have to be his friend. I really was happy to be his friend, but I found him a bit overwhelming because I felt like I couldn't leave my home without having to see him and talk to him, and his presence on Facebook was pretty annoying. I do agree though, I don't have to be his friend, and I quite like the way you worded it, how to break it off. So thanks. Update, four days later. The first thing I did was delete and block him from Facebook, but that's the easy bit because I was still going to have to talk to him in person. I, coincidentally, ran into him on Monday. The first thing he said to me was, Have you deleted your Facebook or something? Because I can't find you anymore. So I went for it and gave a long speech about how he's a nice guy and I thought we could be friends, but I feel like I'm leading him on by hanging out together as I'm really not interested. He replied that he really does just want to be friends and that it would be more awkward now if we're not. I just said something like, I don't want to give you the wrong impression so I think it's best for now if we're not. And then I just quickly left before he could say anything else. I felt like a bit of a jerk saying it, but I guess I had to tell him, and I'm glad I did because he was overwhelming me slightly. So far it's worked, and I haven't actually seen him since then, but it has only been like two days. However, last night I got a rambling long letter through my door. It came quite late, so I'm almost hoping he was drunk or something when he delivered it, because I think it's kind of weird and also vaguely insulting. I think I'll just type it out as it's difficult to explain the tone of the letter. So here it is. Dear OP, you didn't give me much of a chance the other night 
and there is more I wanted to say, though this might actually be an easier way for me to explain my thoughts and feelings. I know we had only talked a few times before our tryst, but I felt like there was an obvious connection between us. I'm sure you must have felt it too, or I don't think he would have come home with me that night. I'm not the type of guy to hook up with random people I don't really know well, but I was extremely attracted to you, and when it appeared you reciprocated my feelings, I couldn't help myself. When you told me you weren't interested in anything romantic, I understood, even if it was not what I wanted to hear. I don't know anything about your personal life, part of the reason why I'm not usually interested in hooking up with random people, and so of course I realize why you might not be interested in me. However, I think it is strange you don't at least want to be friends. We shared something very special with each other, and you can't pretend it never happened. It therefore seems only logical that we become friends. It only makes it more awkward if we aren't. I just want to say if you feel embarrassed or worried that I think of you as crappy, don't be. I don't judge you. That would be a terrible double standard. Though be careful, because some men may see your behavior as crappy, especially if you refuse to talk to them after. Just like when a guy doesn't call a girl after they hook up, he's seen as a jerk. Really, the point of me saying all this is just to repeat that I understand you are not interested in a relationship with me, and I respect that. However, I'm just going to say it. I really like you. You're a fun, smart, and beautiful girl, and I would love to get to know you more. I don't think you can deny that we got along very well before that night, and I don't think what happened should change anything. Don't think you're leading me on. I'm a grown guy, and I know that no means no, and can handle just being friends with you. But I respect what you said to me, even if it hurt a little and will keep my distance from you from now on. If you change your mind, and if you ever want to talk to me or if you need anything, you know where I live, and I will always welcome you. That's what neighbors are for, right? I do feel a bit bad, because he obviously does like me and has put a lot of emotional value on what happened between us, but I just don't feel like I can deal with someone as intense as him. Maybe it's just me, but I do think that his letter has confirmed that he is a bit odd, so I'm glad that I said what I said and I was up front with him. I think he'll leave me alone now. He has so far, though I hope if we do see each other, we can be polite and it won't be too awkward, but it probably will be. Make sure your friends and family know about him. Thanks. I already have, but hopefully things will go no further. Update 2 I was hoping that there would be no more updates to this because he managed to go for a week without contacting me. I hadn't seen or heard from him for a few days, so I thought things were blowing over and he had gotten over it. Then yesterday afternoon, I was getting some stuff out of my car and I suddenly hear his voice say, Hey, do you need a hand? Of course we were going to see each other again at some point and I thought I was polite with him by just saying, Hey, no, I'm fine, thanks. I really didn't think this was rude, and I really didn't need any help anyway, but he seemed to get offended by it and started to get mad at me. He said something like, What's your problem? I'm only trying to help you. All I've ever done is be nice to you, but you're still acting like a jerk. I think he said more, but I was kind of shocked at how he reacted. He stormed off before I could say anything, but I don't even know what I would have said, as I was a bit stunned and also totally embarrassed because there were people around who probably heard it all. I was also a bit upset, because I know that he's allowed to feel a bit used or whatever, as he obviously liked me more than I liked him, but I do think this outburst was uncalled for. I've made my feelings clear to him now, and I know the truth hurts sometimes, but I don't think he has to take it out on me like this. This morning I woke up to another letter. This one is quite short, and so I'll just type it out again. Dear OP, I want to apologize for shouting at you earlier. I let my anger get the better of me, and I'm sorry about that, but I can't help but get frustrated at your behavior. I get that you're not interested in me, and that you don't want to be my friend. Even if I do find it strange, you're aware of my feelings on this, so I won't repeat them. However, when someone is trying to help you, it's good manners to accept it, or at the very least be grateful. Again, I'm sorry, and I realize I need to think about the way I acted, and will try not to do it again. By the way, this is how adults deal with awkward situations. They don't pretend they never happened. Hope you accept my apology and the little bit of advice I gave you. Maybe I should be grateful he apologized, but I almost think this letter is worse because he's not even trying to hide the insults and is totally patronizing. I don't know how to deal with him anymore. He seems to have gotten over his love for me, but now he has some grudge against me. If he really thinks all this about me, I don't even know why he wants to talk to me and be friends. 
It must have been like a month since we hooked up now, so I don't know why he can't accept it and just move on. I kind of want to talk to him again now, but I get the feeling that's what he wants me to do. Should I just ignore him and hope that he gets bored when he realizes I won't give him any attention? Or should I tell him again, more assertively, that I want him to leave me alone? I'm so stressed about seeing him again though, because I don't know what it's going to be like. Time to move. I'm actually seriously considering this, but I can't really afford to. I'm thinking this would be the easiest thing to do though. My parents aren't really an option, but I'm going to call my brother. For obvious reasons, I haven't told him anything about this, but I'm going to tell him and I think he would help me out financially. Call the cops. I did think about doing this, but I just don't know what I would say. I hooked up with someone and now they've sent me a couple letters even though I don't want him to. I just don't think they will take it seriously. I think I will call them to see what my options are. However, even if I can get a no contact order or whatever, I don't think I would want to live that close to him and have to see him regularly. Update 3. Hopefully this is the final update. Things have happened quite quickly since my last one. I was still kind of undecided whether I should write to him to tell him to leave me alone as this would give me proof of things if it went further or to just ignore him. Anyway, I called my brother who I didn't initially want to tell about all of this but I thought I probably should tell someone in my family. He was totally adamant I shouldn't contact him and I should call the cops if he continues. So I took his advice and decided to not communicate with my neighbor. I sort of regret telling my brother now because he really did not help the situation. I had been out on Friday night and stayed over at my friend's house so I didn't get back until Saturday morning. I came back wearing what I had been out in so to my neighbor it probably looked like I had spent the night with a guy so this may have made him a bit more angry. He was in the hallway when I got back. I'm totally sure he had been waiting for me and he said to me, I don't appreciate getting threatening messages from your brother. I honestly had no idea what he was talking about so that's what I said and I found out that my brother had sent him some kind of threatening message telling him to leave me alone. He then was saying stuff, why can't you tell me this yourself? Why can't you at least talk to me? I just don't understand you. I responded something like, I'm sorry about the messages. I didn't know he sent them, but I have told you I don't want you to contact me anymore, yet you keep sending me these letters and I think he's just worried about me. This is when he got pretty angry and was saying stuff like, what are you worried about? And how he had just been trying to be nice. Yeah, he actually said that. He pretty much just repeated what he said in the letters but it was the first real time he actually scared me a little. I didn't really know what to do, but then he started calling me insulting names to my face, and I was like, forget this, I'm not listening to you anymore, leave me alone, and I went straight to my apartment. As I was walking away, he tried to backtrack and apologize, but I didn't want to give him any more attention, so I ignored him. The first thing I did after this was talk to my brother again because I was kind of annoyed at him for getting involved, and I wanted to find out exactly what he said. So he got his Facebook from one of my friends and sent him this message. You need to leave my sister alone. You're creeping her out. If you don't, there will be consequences. So I guess it does sound a little threatening, but it's not as bad as I thought it might have been. Even though I was worried that my brother's message might have been seen as provocation, I decided that I was going to call the police. I waited until the next day because I was tired and it was a bit late after talking to my brother. I shouldn't have been surprised that I woke up to another letter. I think he loves having the last word. It's not very long, but here it is. Dear OP, I'm sorry for some of the things I said to you yesterday. I didn't mean them, but the heat of the moment got to me. I did feel threatened by what your brother said to me. All I've tried to do is talk to the person I live next door to after I hooked up with them. You've made it pretty clear you're not interested in me, and I have accepted that. However, I have explained to you multiple times that I find it strange you don't want to talk so I think you could be more understanding to my feelings instead of just labeling me a creep. I think we need to talk like adults in person because I feel so frustrated that you don't understand what I've tried to say to you in my letters and the only way to do it now is face to face. I won't let my anger get the better of me like it has previously and surely you must see this is a better idea than getting your brother to send me messages. There was no way I was going to talk to him in person again as the last two times we spoke he just got angry with me and started calling me names. I wanted the whole situation over now, so I called the police. It was the non-emergency thing and they were actually very helpful. I was prepared for them to not care. Then they asked me to go to the station and I had to show all of the stuff he sent me, the letters and Facebook messages, etc. They filed a report 
and originally they offered to call him, but when I told them I didn't have his number, they said they would go and talk to him. I just want to make this clear for those who responded to me before, saying going to the cops was too far. This isn't a restraining order. He hasn't been charged or anything. All I've done is file a police report, and we have both agreed to not contact each other, and if either one of us contacts each other, then it will go further. I was sort of expecting for him to send another letter after this, but he hasn't. I know it's only been a couple of days, but I do feel better about the situation now. I'm going to stay here for now. I might talk to my landlord, but I don't think he would let me break my lease. If I feel like I don't want to stay, I think my brother would help me out with money. I do feel bad about what happened, and of course, I should never have hooked up with him. The number one lesson I have learned is don't hook up with your neighbor. But if anyone reading this finds themselves in a similar situation, I guess my advice is to trust your instinct and go to the cops because they can be helpful and it doesn't mean they're going to start arresting people. Anyways, thanks for all the advice. It was appreciated. Final update. What a mess this has all turned into, but I really do think it's over now, so I thought I would do a quick final update. Initially, I was thinking I would just try to stick out living there until my lease ended, but on the encouragement of some of the replies of my last post, I decided to talk to my landlord. He was not really very understanding and was like, you shouldn't have hooked up with him, which I guess is true. He said there's nothing he can do now, but if I wanted to break the lease, I could, but it would cost me two months rent as a termination fee and I have to give 60 days notice, though he did say to let him know if anything else happens. So I left it, but I was living in like a constant anxiety of seeing him or that he would just do something else. Then I talked to my brother again and he told me that my neighbor had been messaging him saying things like, how does it feel to know your sister's a jerk? And other similar things. I wasn't really sure if I could go to the police again with this because he wasn't directly contacting me, but I realized I didn't want to stay anymore. My brother agreed to help me come up with the money, so I thought that would be that and I could get away. Then maybe a couple of days later, I ran into my neighbor. It probably was just a coincidence. It was bound to happen at some point. The weird thing was, he was being super friendly and asked how I was, etc., and didn't mention any of the stuff that had happened. I found it almost creepier than when he was being aggressive, and I told him that he was supposed to be leaving me alone, and I wanted him to stop contacting my brother. He said something like, I thought we had moved past all that. This is when I seriously began to think there's something really wrong with him, and I just told him again to leave me alone. Then, surprise, he sent me another letter. I can't find it right now, but it basically said, There was no need to contact the police before, and I hope you aren't thinking about doing it again. But the tone of it was kind of threatening. I went to the police again, and things got a little more serious this time. I got a temporary injunction against him, then there was a hearing, and I got a final injunction, restraining order. Because of this, I was able to break my lease without a termination fee, with only a 30 days notice. I stayed with a friend for a couple of weeks, but this week, I've moved into a new place, and I finally feel like I can move on from all of this. Thanks for the advice, it surely gave me the confidence to go to the cops. Am I the jerk for feeding my kids stale food and calling my wife lazy? I, 37 male, and my wife, 36 female, have two kids who are 5 and 7. My wife is pregnant with our third right now. She's 20 weeks pregnant. So my daughters have never been picky about their food since I used to cook all meals and never introduced them to junk food. However, about two months back, I was assigned to a new project at work and started working long hours, 70 hours a week so I've been unable to cook as often now. I wanted to hire a cook because my wife was having severe pregnancy symptoms, but my wife said she wanted to try cooking for our kids and she also didn't like the idea of a stranger in our house. I agreed to her idea since she suggested it herself. For the first month or so, she cooked pretty diligently for the kids and both of us as well. However, after that, she reduced the quality of the meals. What I mean is, she started making easy to cook foods for the kids. She also started giving them junk foods as snacks so that they wouldn't be hungry for real meals. I chalked it up to her pregnancy nausea for the first few weeks, but last week when I prepared an elaborate meal for the family on Sunday, the kids refused to even touch the food because they wanted the usual buttered noodles. So I told my wife that I'd be cooking all the meals from now onwards because the kids are getting spoiled from eating junk food all the time. She got mad at me and said she's trying her hardest and I should be more appreciative. I told her no one forced her to cook and I had already suggested hiring a cook, but she was the one who refused. She said that I don't understand her discomfort with having a cook and that hiring one was out of the question. She also told me that I can cook all the meals if I think it's so easy to feed the kids healthy food. 
I told her that I would do just that. That very night, I stayed up, making different kinds of healthy food options for the week. Fruit salad, chicken stir-fry, pasta sauce with veggies, mushrooms, and tomatoes, then blended it all. Cauliflower soup and banana bread. I froze everything so they could be reheated during the week. I've been just reheating food throughout the week and giving it to the kids. Since they want only noodles, I add the sauce and chicken stir-fry to the noodles along with grated cheese. They just eat it without detecting any veggies in it. For their school lunches, I pack ham and cheese or tuna or chicken sandwiches the night before along with fruit salad and chocolate milk. They get a slice of banana bread for after school snack, sandwiches and soup for dinner for me and my wife. My wife told me the food tastes good, but it's stale food, so she doesn't think it's better than what she used to cook for the family. I told her at least I was putting effort into the meals, unlike her, who was using the kids' picky behavior as an excuse to be lazy. She got mad at me and said that she wasn't being lazy and that the kids really were picky. Now she's not speaking to me for the past two days. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk for what you're feeding your kids. Those seem like good options, but you are the jerk for what you said to your wife. She's clearly not used to cooking like you. I'm guessing there's a reason you've been doing the cooking until now, and being pregnant while caring for two kids can be exhausting. Maybe instead of fighting about who's doing the cooking right, you could make it a team effort. Some of your early prepared meals mixed in with some healthy options made by her. That might make her feel less overwhelmed about taking over a chore she isn't used to and she'll be less likely to burn out and resort to food that isn't healthy. Make a meal plan together even. Always remember, you're a team. You win or lose together. Neither of you can win alone. Not the jerk, and here's why. I don't care that she's pregnant. You offered her many reasonable solutions. She insisted on being the one to cook and mess up your kids' eating habits and turn them into picky eaters by being lazy. Let's be honest, it doesn't matter why. Yes, she is pregnant and caring for two other kids, but if she couldn't continue to provide healthy meals, then she should have communicated that and asked for help and you two could have figured out a solution together. Then, once you realized that she wasn't handling it and she was not feeding your kids properly, then you took that pressure off of her and took on the task she clearly could not handle. Again, doesn't matter that she's pregnant or why she can't handle it. She clearly can't handle it. You didn't demand she work harder or fix it herself. You solved the issue and took on the task yourself. Furthermore, you're not feeding them stale food, and it's not the same as her crappy junk unbalanced food. What you are doing is meal planning and meal prep, and it's absolutely appropriate and healthy, and even recommend it. The fact that she wants to belittle your effort to help her and feed them healthier meals and take the pressure off her makes her a huge jerk. She should be grateful. Finally, she wants to argue that the kids are picky eaters. One, they weren't picky until she made them picky by feeding them garbage. Two, they clearly are not that picky because they're eating what you're making. Although calling her lazy probably didn't help your situation and probably makes you a jerk in some ways, we all can't be perfect in our communications and maybe you need to work on that a little. You're the jerk for calling your pregnant wife lazy when you clearly have different operating abilities when it comes to food and meals. Take some time for communication and meal prep together instead of just name calling. Also, not all meals need to be healthy. Everything in moderation. Asking her to cook from scratch every night is a lot for someone who doesn't have the skill set. Then you pile on kids who can be picky because, yes, they are being picky. Plus pregnancy. Why don't you teach your wife a few easy meals or create a meal plan with her cooking two nights and you cooking three nights? It doesn't need to be all or nothing. And you need to work on your communication and empathy. Lazy? You owe her a huge apology. You're the jerk. Today I messed up by injuring a heart surgeon in the middle of heart surgery. I'm an assistant in heart surgery. I work with over a dozen different surgeons. This one doctor is one of the OGs at this place. Been around forever, seen it all, done it all. Nothing really bothers him. He's very quiet and reserved during surgery. I'm new here, so I'm really trying to make a good impression. The case before I worked with this doctor was literally the smoothest case I've ever assisted. I was truly a step ahead the entire case and the surgeon didn't have to ask me to do anything because I was already doing it. It felt so great. So, when I saw my assignment was to work with him, I was super pumped to get a chance to build on how great the previous case went. So, there we are in the middle of the heart surgery. The heart is arrested, the heart lung machine is cycling the blood instead, and we have the heart literally cut open to replace a valve. Right in the middle of placing the valve sutures into the heart, he handed me two of them, and I went to place a hemostat clamp on them outside of the open chest, like I had with the rest of them. 
This is a routine and imprecise move, so I was kind of nonchalant about it. Unfortunately, the surgeon pulled his hand back right as I went to clamp, and I clamped a metal clamp onto his pinky knuckle. He lurched back and screamed in pain, looked at me and said, Now why did you do that for? I was speechless, being caught totally off guard. Obviously, I hadn't done it on purpose. This reserved and quiet surgeon did a just scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl spike with the now contaminated needle driver he had been holding onto the floor, ripped off his gown and gloves and stormed out of the room. The entire room was pin drop quiet. What do we do with this open chest and open heart without a surgeon? What happens now? My career flashed before my eyes. My ears burnt like lit sparklers and sweat started running down my neck. My surgical goggles started fogging up. For a second, I felt like I was going to pass out, but 30 seconds later, we heard the surgeon slamming the metal panel onto the scrub sink and we knew he was scrubbing back in. He came back into the room a few minutes later, clearly red hot mad, but we went right back to work and finished the case without a single word about what happened. When he was getting ready to leave the room, I apologized sincerely, which he kind of resentfully accepted. Edit for clarification. Don't mistake my comment about being nonchalant as being careless. The point was that I wasn't in the chest. I was back off to the side just clamping sutures together, so it's a different kind of movement than handling tissues inside the chest. My mistake was in having tunnel vision and not seeing the unexpected movement of the surgeon, not in how I was clipping the sutures together. Empty everything from my bag? You got it. I work in a transportation facility which requires me to go through a security checkpoint that inspects bags and such, and you have to go through a metal detector. They require us to remove any electronics or wires from our bags. Since I'm a technician, I carry a laptop and network cables in my bag plus some small hand tools. I was told I can leave the hand tools in the bag, but the wires and electrics have to be taken out. Fine. So I've been doing this for months, until yesterday. I go through as usual, unpacking my bag of the required items and putting them in the bin and send it through. I send my bag afterwards. X-Ray says nothing, so I start reloading my bag. This is when X-Ray stops talking to her coworker friends and realizes she has to work. They start going through my bag, pulling out everything I just put back in, telling me, this is supposed to come out and go in a bin. I did, you weren't paying attention. X-Ray then proceeds to tell me, anything metal has to come out, everything has to come out. Fine. Today rolls around and the same person is running X-Ray, so I take all of my usual stuff out of my bag and put it in a bin. Then I start removing everything from my bag. Tissue pack? Check. Quick wipes? Check. Pens? Check. Candy wrapper from three days ago? Check. You get the point. Every single item I pulled from my bag. Meanwhile, X-Ray is getting testy and a line is forming behind me. X-Ray tells me I'm holding up the line. Sorry, you said everything. After my bins and empty bag go through the X-Ray and come out, I begin to repack everything while watching the line behind me. A guy is now doing the same thing I just did, pulling everything from his bag. You did tell that other guy everything. I don't want to get in trouble. The next guy behind him started doing it as well. As I set my bag on the floor and began to walk away, I turned to X-Ray and said, You did say everything. Have a nice day. And left. I think I might go back through after lunch. Clarification. This is a security checkpoint for employees of this transportation facility. It's a private security company and not any government transportation security, though most of them act like they work for the government. Karen demands I have a baby for her. My oldest sister is 40. She always wanted to be a mom, but some complications meant she was never able to be a biological mom. In her 20s, she met a widower with kids and married him, admitting her intention was to become a mom through them. Her stepkids were never okay with her like that, and for the last 16 years, she has struggled to come to terms with the fact that not one of them even considers her their mom or embraces her like she would like them to. This is something she always complains about when she's around our family, especially me and our sisters. Three years ago, one of my sisters was expecting her third kid and she was going through a lot and struggling with her pregnancy. She wasn't sure they could handle a third kid and worried about financials because her husband had a new job that paid less than his old one. The old one folded a few months before that and they had already made adjustments to factor in the new household budget. My oldest sister harassed her for months about letting her adopt the baby, going as far as going to our brother-in-law about it and telling him she wanted the baby and he should talk our sister into it. It never happened, but it did harm her relationship with the rest of the family. 
I gave birth to my second kid in November and had a procedure to make sure I had no more kids. Both my pregnancies have been awful on my body and I didn't want to risk putting myself through that again. My sister brought this up last week. She said I was selfish to sterilize myself before offering to be a surrogate for her and that I could have given her my youngest to adopt at the very least. I told her I wanted my kids, so I would never give one up like that. She said her dreams of motherhood were important. I told her nobody owed her motherhood though, and the way she was carrying on was wrong and concerning, and she had brushed aside our concerns before, but she needed to get some help because she can't keep demanding others give her their kids. She flipped out and started screaming that as her family, we should want to help her reach her dream of motherhood, and we should be more understanding because she gets crap from her stepkids and doesn't get any of the joy the rest of us have. We've been sensitive for years. We encouraged her to speak to someone countless times, but she keeps going on like this and it's concerning. Her marriage has felt the strain of it all, but I know I might have been harsh saying we didn't owe her motherhood, which is why I'm here. Am I the jerk? I get that being a parent, especially a mother in this case, is important to some people and to not fulfill that dream is something to genuinely grieve. However, after being raised by people who felt that they were owed kids, it caused a lot of generational issues for us. We weren't seen as people as much as toys to show off, and as with most toys, we continued to lose value over time when we were no longer new. Honestly, the way she's acting is making me grateful she can't have kids. I can only imagine the pressure, codependency, and general issues a kid would face with her attitude. My mom wasn't nearly this bad, but I still essentially was her parent, and guess who I no longer talk to? Wow. First off, your sister needs a lot of help. She is obsessed with having kids, and she's turning into someone most people wouldn't even want to be around. She needs therapy, and quite possibly medication. Second, not the jerk. You actually put it very well. Nobody is owed motherhood, and your sister is wrong to expect others to hand it to her. Your words were a bit blunt, but I have the feeling you have tried to be nice about the whole thing for a long time, and the comment about you being a surrogate for her was the last straw. It's not up to you to make her a mom. Good luck to your family, particularly her husband. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.